ground covers, shrubs, vines, and trees that are less likely to catch on fire. There's no such thing as a fireproof plant, but there are many species of plants that are low growing, are attractive, they require very little water, and they are difficult to ignite. For advice on which low flammability plants are best suited for your area, just check with your local nursery. Or log on to www.smartgardening.com for a list of Firewise plants. Either way, there's a variety of plants that'll do the trick. Some very effective ground covers include rock rose, red apple, and aloe. For shrubbery, you can choose hedging roses,
Ladies and gentlemen, the December 11th, 2023, regular meeting of the Malibu City Council is now called to order. On account of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being held in a hybrid format that allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom webinar. In-person participants, if you would like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to our clerk over here on my right. Remote participants, if you would like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. Kelsey, may we please have a roll call see who's here. Councilmember Grisanti? Here. Councilmember Riggins? Here. Councilmember Silverstein? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Here. Mayor Yearing? Yes, here. You have a quorum. Okay. Any in-person speaker cards? We don't have any of those. Anybody online? No, we didn't receive any in-person speaker, in speaker cards, and we do not have any participants or raised hands in Zoom. Very good. Okay, thank you very much. We will now recess to closed session to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. We'll reconvene here around 6.30 p.m. to give you a regular, regular session, to begin the regular session, and hear a closed session report. Thank you very much.
Okay, I apologize for the delay. Uh, we ready to go? All right. The December 11th, 2023 regular City Council meeting of the Malibu City Council is now called to order on account of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. This meeting is being held in a hybrid format, which allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom. In-person participants, if you'd like to speak, please submit a request to speak to our form to our clerk over to my right. Remote participants, if you'd like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the enemy wishes to speak on his call. Kelsey, give us a roll call. Let's see who's here. Councilmember Grisanti. Here. Councilmember Riggins. Here. Councilmember Silverstein. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Here. Mayor Uring. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Graham, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I know you're, you're, I know you're from that, but <laughs> you're the best you can. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Trevor, can we get a closed session report, please? Yes, at 5.30 p.m., the City Council met an open session and then recessed to closed session for the items listed on the posted agenda. All five council members were present and no reportable action was taken. Report on posting the agenda, please, Kelsey. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on December 1st, 2023, with the amended agenda posted on December 8th, 2023. Need a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Okay. May I make a friendly amendment? Sure. I'd like to adjourn in the memory of Carl Vellante, who passed away on November 9th of this year. Um, he was a local Malibu architect who did a, just a great person in the community. And Thank you. Should remind me that we get to the end. I'll make sure we do that. Thank you. Okay. We have time now for our proclamation. Did, would you like a vote on that motion before oh, yeah, you get into the yeah, please, give me a, We always need votes. Give us a vote. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, time for a proclamation. We could uh, bring all the city council people in. Okay, okay cool. Mr. Van Dyke, you can, sit, I'm, we're gonna, you can I'm come up to the podium if you would like to join us. You, it's up to you. I thought you said me, I can't hear very well. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. <laughs> shall, shall I sing? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I've been working on this. you got to let me do this, man. Right? Oh, great. All right. Hope you've got your glasses. I got them. Okay. Yeah. Good evening. This is a super califragilistic espialidocious moment. Very good. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Now, I know you used to have like, Julie Andrews standing next to you when they say that, but this a municipal government, I'm the best we could afford. So. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In an unparalleled career that has spanned more than seven decades and earned him five Emmys, a Tony, a Grammy, a BAFTA, a SAG Lifetime Achievement Award, introduction is the Television Hall of Fame, recognition as a Disney legend, a star in, on a Hollywood work, work of, Walk of Fame, and adoration of generations of fans. Dick Van Dyke has remained one of the most popular and beloved performers in show business history. That's you I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> His enduring career includes starring roles in The Dick Van Dyke Show, Mary Poppins, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Bye Bye Birdie, and The Night at the Museum. When he wasn't performing, he became an author of two New York Times best-selling books. Here in Malibu, He's beloved despite the fact that he scares the bejesus out of children and adults every year with the Halloween display he puts up at his house. <laughs> That's been 40 years. I, I've been watching it. I know. I go by it every year. It's really cool. Okay? Most, imp most importantly, I'm, I've been working on this. And I can see it. <laughs> most importantly, he has brightened the lives and put happy smile in the faces of millions of people. And I can testify to that, that fact because I'm one of the people he's done that for. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Proclamation.
Dick Van Dyke. Whereas the city of Malibu honors longtime Malibu resident and legendary entertainer Richard Dick Van Dyke in recognition of his contributions to the entertainment industry and his dedication to the community of Malibu. And whereas in his career that has spanned over many decades, he has received five Emmys, a Tony, a Grammy, BAFTA, SAG, Lifetime Achievement Awards, introduction into the Tele Television Hall of Fame, recognition as a Disney legend, and a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I don't remember all. And we, yeah, well, that's why I put it all down so we, I wouldn't forget it. I mean, it was, uh, whereas Mr. Van Dyke received the Kennedy Center Honor, one of the highest, highest artistic achievements, the medallions celebrate each recipient for their lifetime contributions to the American culture. And I watched that show. You were very good. They, yeah, Thank you. That was, that was excellent. Okay. Whereas Mr. Van Dyke is not only, not only a national treasure, but a treasure here in Malibu. He is well known and respected throughout Malibu for his hard work, support of the Malibu Labor Exchange, and the Malibu and Urgent Care. And I remember the, the article you wrote about getting, uh, buying underwear here in Malibu. That's one thing you can't I, 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 no, I, know, I remember that. Okay. Whereas the community of Malibu is thankful for Mr. Van Dyke's support of the arts in our local Malibu schools. Now, therefore, it be, it, it be resolved that the City Council of the City of Malibu declares December 13th, 2023, as a Dick Van Dyke Day, in recognition for his amazing career, numerous contributions to the world of entertainment, and thank him for his dedication to the city of Malibu. Thank you. He presented this 11th day of December 2023. Mr. Van Dyke, thank you very, very much. Thank please, you. Please say so. <laughs> <laughs> I have a cheering section. <laughs> Most of you are. <laughs> this is the biggest thing since Burgess Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I won't be 98 until uh, what? Wednesday? No, tomorrow. Wednesday. Is tomorrow Wednesday? <laughs> I've been around a long time. I'll be 98, and if I had known I was going to live this long, I would have taken a lot better care of myself. <laughs> I was born in 1925, back when you know gas was 14 cents a gallon, and ice cream cones and nickel. At that, in 1925, it's when Mrs. Ringe first put some acreage on sale at about 15 bucks an acre. Wouldn't you like to have been here back then? <laughs> and it was then the Chumash Indians called it Uma, Li, Uma Liwa. Is that right? Uma Liwo, which means it's really hard surfing here. <laughs> uh, what else did I got to say? Oh, I don't want to bore you with this. <laughs> I guess that's about it. I just can't thank you enough. It's such a great honor. Uh, who was big uh, from uh, the Western show? Our old buddy. Who? Dan Blocker. Dan. Yeah, Dan and me. Yeah, I'm, I'm up with those guys. I love them both. Uh, well, I have been here 40 years, and... Uh, I should tell you what, about 1948, when I first got married, my wife and I moved out here to a little two-room apartment on the beach. We couldn't pay the rent. We got thrown out. So this is my revenge. <laughs> Thank you. God bless. Thank you very, very much. Hold you closer. Let me get one picture with you. We're going to get the city okay. council down to take a quick picture, if that's okay. Come on down here, guys. I think I said it right. Uma Liwo. Uma Limo, that's right. Or Uma Limo. There you go. Yeah, bring that with us. Go ahead, you take, do that first. A standing ovation I got. Woo! Yes! <laughs> okay, let's get a picture with the whole city council. Can you see Angela Little, too? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are we good? Yeah, we're going to do one more picture. We're gonna, I think right, if we can sit up here, stand up here, we'll get a picture of you. Oh. And the oh, you right. want to have your thing? Yes. Arlene, you should be up there. Arlene. Arlene. Yeah. Do you not want to? Yes. One more, 
Alright, here we go. Oh, one, two, three. Oh, there's one more. One, two, three. Yes. Yeah, I got it. Well, now it's time for us to do another award. I'd like to uh, ask Jeff Jennings to come to the podium, please. All right. <laughs> I was going to say, I was, <clears throat> I was going to mention my Emmys. <laughs> Well, everybody knows Jeff Jennings. This is, this is one person that wherever you go in Malibu, you say, oh, do you know Jeff Jennings? And they go, yes, I do. And I have to tell you, you have built a legacy here, a service to our city that is equaled by very few, if any. You know, I think you coached baseball. You were uh, equestrian. You did so many things even before the city was formed. And you were on the city council with three times. Yeah. Yeah. And you were my appointee to the planning commission when I got elected. And I told you, Jeff, just teach me what I need to do. Don't let me make any mistakes. <laughs> and you, you honored that. And then you said at the end of 10 months, I think it's time for me to turn the keys over to someone else. So reluctantly, we let you off the planning commission, but we didn't let you out of town. So uh, you're still here with us uh, forever, as far as we're concerned. The other thing I want to mention is we have a plaque here. And this is a plaque that we give to, for those of you who don't know it, I'll show it to the audience here. This is what we give to people that have meant a lot to the city and done a lot for it. But this little piece of wood and this tile cannot represent all the things that Jeff has done for us. And I'm going to read the uh, statement with it. But I want you to know that this comes from every person in the city of Malibu that thanks you for all you've done. Thank you. So let me read the statement here. We have a city council policy that allows for the award of a city tile to any individual who served the city for more than seven years. I think you qualify, <laughs> including service on city commissions. Tonight, we are recognizing Jeff Jennings for all of his time volunteered and the exceptional service he has provided to the community of Malibu. Jeff Jennings served continuously on the Planning Commission since 2008 when he was first appointed. Jeff has also previously served as a city council member and a mayor. We thank him for his years of service and wish him a happy retirement, although I don't think you're retired. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> thank you very much. You want to say a few words? Uh, sure. Um, I have said in the past that being one of the uh, five voices on making a decision is is a privilege, and it's a privilege I've appreciated uh, experiencing. It hasn't all been uh, rough. I've got to serve with uh, some very dedicated and uh, hardworking, count, uh, I was going to say council members, I mean uh, commissioners, including Mayor Uring, um, and uh, I got to know entire generations of planning staff, uh, and uh, so it, 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 has been, uh, it has been a pleasure. I, um, I do feel, however, though, that, um, or I did feel, it's time to uh, have some younger blood on the Planning Commission and get some younger people who are actually living here to uh, move forward. So um, thank you very much for this. I appreciate the honor. Good night. Oh, and I would say, it's, we're going to have to leave. We're going to have to check, uh, get down to LAX to catch a plane. So it's not to be taken as a commentary on the quality of your meeting tonight, but we are going to have we to go. get a picture over here real quick. Okay.
Okay, Doug, thank you very much. Uh, the next item on our agenda, we have moved forward item 4A ahead of communication from the public, and this deals with our ADU ordinance, and we did that for the opportunity if members of the public wanted to speak on that, uh, we wanted to get it on early enough in the agenda for you to have an opportunity to do that. So with that, item 4A, uh, it, do we have Richard? I think I, I think what kind of a staff report you're going to give us will be interesting because we didn't change anything from the last meeting. We're really just trying to nail down some of the components of this thing. So, so Richard, you and, and Joyce can go first. Huh? Oh, Tyler. Oh, Tyler. Okay, Tyler. You're carrying these guys, Tyler. That's good. Good Please evening, go. Mayor. You're on. You're on. Go ahead. Yes. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, at your last meeting, uh, last um, two weeks ago, you had the discussion on the city's uh, accessory dwelling unit ordinance and continued it to tonight's meeting uh, because you did not have enough time to finish conversation on all of the items. I wanted to touch on the discussion, two of the discussion items uh, that the council still wanted to continue discussion on, and that was the two means of access, uh, street access to a highway, and uh, under development standards, the uh, council was still considering the uh, size options for an ADU. Also, um, there was a discussion about guest house and revising the definition to add no kitchen. And so if the council, um, we believe there was consensus on that, and if uh, that is uh, accurate, uh, we just need to remember to add it to your uh, motion tonight um, to make sure that is included. And then um, and the council had directed uh, us to include an owner occupancy requirement. Um, recently, uh, and there's a new state law that prohibits cities from requiring owner occupancy, and that uh, was signed by the governor uh, a couple of months ago in October, and it goes into effect January uh, 1st, 2024, so the city can no longer require uh, owner occupancy in the municipal code. Uh, the council could consider it uh, in the local coastal program. However, uh, staff does not believe coastal would approve it. Um, we believe it would come back as a suggested modification because the uh, coastal uh, commission uh, wants to work with HCD as much as uh, possible. And in those instances where uh, they can harmonize the two uh, ordinances, uh, they want to do that. I wanted to talk a little bit about the access requirements and uh, make sure that um, everybody was uh, clear on the two areas. So Los Angeles County has two codes, two separate codes, in which they address uh, accessory dwelling units. The first one is the um, section 22.140, 640, and that is for all county areas uh, outside of the coastal zone, and that is where the two means of access language uh, first originated. And that, um, however, the council was given a um, copy of a letter that staff recently uh, found from HCD. Uh, it was date, dated about five months ago um, to the county, indicating that the provision for two means of access is inconsistent with state law and cannot, uh, the county cannot enforce it and they needed to amend their code. This is a, a fairly recent event. Um, all cities and jurisdictions are uh, supposed to submit their AD ordinance to the state for review uh, uh, within 30 days. and. There is a list of cities that have done that. The county had not done that. Uh, yet one uh, resident who was denied uh, a ADU because of the uh, two means of access requirements um, reported that to HCD, and HCD has sent a letter to the county telling them that their uh, ordinance is substantially out of compliance with state law, state ADU law. The other. Oh, sorry. 
No. As long as you provide the, the uh, findings that say you want to have two ways of access, they, they're willing to accept that. That's They're looking for that, right? So it isn't like they've said no entirely. It's a question of whether the city can defend itself in making that decision. Is yes, that there correct? have to be uh, evidence. But they, 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 they got to submit the findings, correct? That's what the that's what the H with it, yes yes I'm sorry mayor yes uh, well, but that those find they can't be just written findings they have to have evidence studies and reports okay but we just got to have findings it can be done I'm just I just don't want to dismiss, dismiss the ability to do that yeah, certainly the the city could uh, try try to do that but uh, city, staff has been a unable to find any city in California that uh, had access requirement. Uh, Requirements that HCD has approved, and I don't, think, I don't think I don't think I don't think I want to compare myself to any other city in California yeah, right yeah. now. Right. All right. Just just for, I'm just saying. Look, we, we can we can roll up. People can yell at us, and we pick up our tent and go home, or they can yell at us, and we say we think we're right, and we're going to fight for ourselves. So just keep yes. that in your back. You. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. And then the other section in Los Angeles County is the coastal zone. That has their own separate uh, set of ADU requirements. And uh, that uh, allows a 750 square foot ADU without uh, any road access. And that's the area directly north of the city. And then second units, um, they have both. So they have uh, in the LIP, in the county LIP, they have a category category called habitable accessory buildings, and it includes uh, guest houses, uh, caretakers units, second units, and ADUs. And so for the second units has the provision, uh, has some provision about not uh, um, having a right of way of at least 60 feet, uh, but staff assu assumes that the, um, that ordinance has not been reviewed by HCD since their other ordinance wasn't. Um, and then I wanted to um, show the council and the, and the members of the public the two areas uh, that I am referring to. And so the north area plan is the area where the two means of access uh, requirement uh, currently resides. And that is the light yellow area. And as you can see, that's uh, basically south of Calabasas and south of Agora Hills. Uh, the yellow area, and then the uh, larger blue area is the coastal zone in the county. And that area is where an ADU, a 750 square foot ADU would be required uh, without the access requirements. Council member Stewart had asked uh, for a matrix and then also we wanted to uh, just quickly uh, lay out uh, what is uh, before the council tonight and what you would be considering. Um, so on the uh, permit process, all attached, detached, converted and created from non-habitable space would be processed under the um, LCP with an ACDP. Um, and we do have to have a complete ordinance in our municipal code. And so the municipal code allows uh, either a billing permit only or an administrative plan review permit, either one of those. Um, however, again, most uh, all of the ADUs would be processed under the LCP. Uh, they would not be allowed in a multifamily building in the LCP. Uh, state law requires us to allow them in non-habitable space uh, in a multifamily building. Uh, attached ADUs on a multifamily property is not allowed uh, in either code. Detached ADUs uh, would require an ACDP uh, and if processed under the MMC billing permit only. Decision authority is the same on both and that is the planning director. Um, the difference is if it's processed process under the M uh, LCP, there um, would be a report to the planning commission and it's appealable. If it's processed MMC, that would not be the case. Junior ADUs and internal ADUs are uh, not covered in the municipal, or I'm sorry, the LIP, and that was because um, they are not considered development by coastal staff and or coastal commission. So they, uh, right now there is no term uh, junior ADU or when the second unit ordinance was adopted. And so uh, staff, 
if somebody were to come during that period where we had our second uh, unit or where we have our second unit, we would consider it um, an ADU, even though it's a, a junior ADU under the municipal code. Uh, however, what you have in front of you would not regulate junior ADUs uh, or internal ADUs in an existing single family house. That would be uh, regulated in the municipal code and it would be a building permit only process. It would be approved by the planning director and it would not be reported to the planning commission uh, and it is not appealable. One of the uh, one of the issues that uh, the council is talking about tonight is are discussing tonight is the ADU size, and so this is just a snapshot. Staff had recommended the 1,200 square feet. Uh, options include 900 square feet, which is the second current second unit uh, guest house, 1,000, which is the maximum in the municipal code, or again the 1,200, which staff um, had recommended uh, to match the temporary housing provisions. ADUs uh, uh, process under the municipal code is 850 for a one bedroom, uh, 1,000 for two or more bedrooms. Uh, if you convert an accessory building, uh, and that would be converting um, a, that would be processed under the LCP, and you would have the same size limits, uh, whatever the council decides tonight. Uh, if it was processed under the um, municipal code, there would be no maximum. So that would mean if somebody had a 2,000 square foot accessory building and they converted it to an ADU, they could have a 2,000 square foot ADU. Uh, fortunately, uh, accessory buildings converted would be processed under the LCP. The uh, uh, attached to a primary dwelling, um, it's the size of uh, 50% uh, of the existing dwelling up to the size limit uh, that is decided by the council. Uh, and the uh, MMC, it's the, again the 850 or 1,000 or 50% of uh, a, the single family house, whichever is less. And then the last size is the size for junior ADUs, again being processed under the MMC. It's 500 square feet for a junior. Those are typically bedrooms that have been converted. And then internal ADUs, there is no size limit. So um, that means um, that uh, under the municipal code, somebody could convert an area inside uh, their existing family uh, house without size limits. Uh, the other uh, development standards, I will just briefly go through those, um, uh, focus mainly on the height. Um, height uh, currently uh, is allowed at 18 uh, to up to 28. The uh, ADU uh, ordinance, uh, the council had uh, wanted 16, and the planning commission had wanted 16 uh, feet max with a 24 uh, foot high with a site plan review. And in the municipal code, it's 16 with exceptions up to 25. Um, setbacks are uh, pretty much the same as the second units uh, throughout in the uh, LCP. And in the MMC, it would be four feet rear and side. With that, uh, staff is uh, recommending uh, that after the city council uh, provides direction to staff on the final revisions, that you adopt resolution 2343. It was exhibit one in your packet that would amend the land use plan of the local coastal program. And then after the city attorney reads the title of the ordinance, um, introduce on first reading uh, ordinance number 510, and that was exhibit two in your packet, and that would approve the LCP amendment um, and uh, certain sections of the zoning code uh, regulating um, ADU units. Uh, number three, after the city attorney reads the title of the ordinance, introduce on first reading ordinance 511, and 511 is the ordinance that would amend the municipal code and create an ADU ordinance, uh, the city's ADU ordinance. And then finally, under uh, number four, is to direct staff to schedule a public uh, reading and adoption of both ordinance 510 and 511 for the January 8th meeting. That concludes staff's presentation, and we are here to answer any question the council has. Joyce, thank you very much. Any yeah, um, Joyce, you said, I, I quote, I wrote it down, we need to have a complete ordinance in our MMC. Yes. Uh, why? We're, what's the legal source of that? The because it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't apply when the LP, L, LCP applies, right? 
That, that's correct. I will, I will answer briefly, and then we have Todd on the well, line. Well, maybe he can answer. That, that's, yes. that's a legal question. So, uh, Todd, are you? Good evening, Council. I understand the question to be, why does the city need a full MMC ordinance in compliance with the statute if we have the LCP? Is that right? It's close enough. That is correct. Well, if it's not exact, why don't you clarify it for me? Answer that question and I'll see if I have any other questions. Because any ordinance that you have is null and void as a matter of law if it doesn't conform to the state law. Well, our LCP trump, the LCP and the Coastal Act trump the state, the MMC when it comes to um, development, right? Yes. Okay, so we, we, we don't have an effect, our, our municipal code provisions that purport to deal with development are ineffective, isn't that right? They won't apply. Okay, and are you, are you is, there, is there guidance from a court in California or um, legislative history or anything that specifically deals with cities that have local coastal programs that says their municipal code must include all these provisions which have no effect? No, but that's our advice. Uh, okay. Our so, advice is to do that. Yes, it is, but it's also to explain to us the source of your advice. So is there any, um, there's no decisional law at all, right? No. So what are you basing your advice on other than the fact that you can read words and I can read words? Um, I'm just offering my advice. If you don't like it, I don't need to be cross-examined. Well, well, no, Ted, I'm, I'm, look. I, I'm I, happy I, to tell you where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah, our our okay. office's advice on this point is, is simply based on our interaction with HCD on the ADU side and Coastal on the other, and as a practical matter, HCD expects to see an ordinance that matches the statute. Okay, so, so are, you, are you saying, and I'm, I don't mean to cross-examine you, and I'm not, and I, and I respect your, your views on this, but not just when they're on your own without any basis. Um, are you saying HCD has told coastal cities that they must have a municipal code that addresses things which are ineffective in order to comply with the state law? No. Okay, so who has said that other than you as your advice? It's me as my advice. Based Council on my interactions with HCD, with ADU ordinances in general. Okay. Council but, member, I'm sorry, Council member, or Sir Stein, just to step back for the, the big picture. And so um, once we adopt an ordinance, we have to send it up to HCD uh, for review. And so if we send up an ordinance to HCD that is missing, um, significant portions of state law, they would not be able to approve it uh, because they don't have the authority to review the city's uh, local coastal program. So all of the, their authority is only to review what's what we send up to them in the municipal code. Okay, I, I understand that. It would be good to hear from them directly on that specific question. The, the reason I say this is in my experience, the law is not silly. Um, and it is, in my opinion, silly to have a municipal code that we go to great lengths to adopt and has all kinds of specific provisions which have no effect, that they're just words for the sake of having words and not because they're going to have any legal significance. And I can't believe that in the absence of explicit legislative statement to that effect, that's what we need to do. And I can't, and I have a hard time believing that HCD, when when someone, when lawyer, when good lawyers sit down and talk about this and explain it, would come to the conclusion that we need to have a ridiculous statute that that addresses things that can't, that aren't ineffective. So one ad uh, additional um, thought, and then I don't know if uh, Trevor, Trevor, I think Trevor also yeah. wants uh, wants to weigh on this, but if um, if this if the city, if there was some reason, uh, for instance, the, the city was sued and the court says you have to process under union municipal code, we need an ordinance to process it under. 
Otherwise, we'd have no standards. And I think uh, Trevor is going to. Yeah, I mean, choice raises a good point, and if the, the issue being. If a project is determined to be exempt from the requirement for a coastal development permit, or a state law changes, you know, that would, um, you know, change the exemption, um, then the application for an ADU would have to be processed under our municipal code. And to the extent it doesn't comply with state law, it'll be subject to state law. So that's the backstop. And the provisions put into the um, proposed municipal code amendment are meant to increase local control of an ADU project if it is ever processed under the municipal code. So it's also a backstop. Okay. So let me ask this, Trevor. Could we, have, could we have lawful language that said something to the effect that all ADUs that constitute development, as that term is defined in the Coastal Act, are and shall be governed by the provisions of the LCP and not the MMC? Uh, can you say it one more time? All ADUs that constitute development, as that term is defined in the Coastal Act, are and shall be governed by the provisions of the LCP and not the MMC. Could we have an MMC provision that says that? Well, I, w I would say, first of all, it wouldn't. Uh, what we put in our municipal code isn't going to control how something is processed under our LCP. It's a self-contained document and needs to have Coastal uh, Commission. Coastal Commission certification for it to be in effect. So putting those language in the municipal code would have no effect about how a particular project, did, how a, a project is treated under our local coastal program. So it'd be empty words. If you put it in there, um, it would it would only be advisory to somebody that was reading it, but it wouldn't have any control about how something is actually processed under our local coastal program. Well, no, so I wouldn't we, recommend would... putting that in to avoid confusion and also to avoid confusion uh, from HCD if they're reviewing our municipal code and it doesn't look self-contained to draw them to start looking at the, at the LCP and trying to work those two and try to say that it's integrated somehow into our municipal code. Because the LCP supersedes, it's self-contained, it supersedes, that's where you start. If something is exempt from the LCP, then you go to the municipal code. Only then. Everyone always starts at the LCP, and that's um, what planning will tell anyone that comes in with a project is to start there. And only if your project is exempt, then would you go to the municipal code. Okay, I, I appreciate the answers. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not persuaded, but I suspect others may be. Um, the other question I have is, what is this law that prevents um, owner occupancy? What exactly does it say? Can, can someone tell us that? Because we've been told that that's the law, but we haven't been provided the law. Todd, can you, uh, can, can you provide authority on that? Yeah, I can pull it up. Give me a minute. I, I think the, it's Ting uh, 1397 is the, is the law. I might have it here, too. Council Member uh, Silverstein, while uh, Joyce is looking that up. Um, there is a section that we are proposing tonight uh, in the MMC ordinance of Ordinance 511. Uh, basically, at the beginning of a new chapter, which would be 1744060, um, it kind of lays out the framework for uh, permits that will be processed under the MMC. And it says the following approvals apply to ADUs and JADUs developed under this chapter. Because the city of Malibu lies entirely within the coastal zone, Every ADU application in the city is subject to an analysis for compliance with the Local Coastal Program and Coastal Act before it's reviewed for compliance with this chapter. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. I'm still waiting to... Yeah, I was going to say you're waiting. Yeah. Are we close, to, are we close to getting Bruce an answer because I want to go to public yeah, comment? Yeah, I think he said he has it. Okay. This is Todd from the phone. I have the answer. It's Assembly Bill number 976. The author is... Uh, ting and it eliminated the permanently eliminated the owner occupancy or the ability to impose an owner occupancy requirement prior to this bill as you might already know the state originally had allowed cities to do owner, to impose an owner occupancy requirement and then a year or two ago they took that away 
and said you can't impose any owner occupancy on any ADU that was created between 2020 and 2024. Uh, you could start doing it again in 2025. And uh, predictably, the legislature came back with this latest bill, uh, 976, and uh, took away the allowance starting again in 2025. Okay. So now it's permanently off the table. Uh, so, so Todd, what I'm trying to understand is because I, I assume the words owner occupancy are being used loosely when, when you say it and when Joyce says it, but maybe, maybe not. Uh, what we had been contemplating was a requirement that either the ADU or the principal residents have within it the property owner in order for the property to have an ADU. And I'm hearing, it, maybe again, maybe this is loose language, but I'm hearing the state law doesn't allow us to mandate that to have an ADU, you must li the owner must live in the ADU, which would essentially, no. no. So, exp so explain it, what you mean by owner The statutory phrase is including an owner-occupant requirement and uh, imposing an owner-occupant requirement off the table, and that's with reference to the property, to any dwelling on the property. You can't require them to live in the ADU, the JADU, or the main house. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. All right. Any other questions before we go to public comment? All right, public comment. Uh, we've got two speakers. Joe, I think you're up first. Colin, you're up first. Colin, you're up first. I'm, I'm going to donate my time to Joe um, to play a video clip. Okay. Thank you. Is there a video clip we're playing? I do want to see that whatever we appro approve, if we do approve something tonight, include the two entrance requirement. I, I, I want to come back to one other issue, which is uh, this, this two please. entrance thing. I am a little disturbed process-wise with the fact that the staff didn't come back with that included in the proposal, because we made it very clear that we had, a, we had at least three people on this council last time, so that we had a consensus to bring this back with a provision that didn't allow an ADU when there was not two entrances. And I've, I've had this problem in the past. It's not, it's not the staff's position to disagree with that and give reasons why it doesn't work and not do it. You, you, can, you can put it in and say, we think this is unwise for the following reasons, but it troubles me that it's not in there. But if you make it super easy to build ADUs everywhere in the city, as much as that's a laudable objective for low income issues, which I don't think are solved in any way, shape, or form in Malibu, you're creating a huge fire danger or evacuation danger. And that's, that's the thing that's driving my analysis of this. And all the reasons that I, and, and I'll state this so that when you bring your lawsuits, you can, you can quote me on it. I actually do want to use whatever vehicles we are permitted to use under state law without going, without violating state law to limit the number of ADUs that can be built because I think they're a fire danger in Malibu and I don't believe that they accomplish low cost housing in Malibu in any way, shape, or form. tell them why we're doing it, right? We gotta give them a justification that says this is why this is important in Malibu. And if you think about it, all right? I mean, we lost a quarter of our homes in the last fire, right? It took five hours to get a goddamn evacuation out of the city. Uh, we can't get insurance in the city. We can't get insurance, right? The insurance guys are telling you it's too, too risky. Uh, Southern California Edison shutting off my damn power every time the wind back, We can consider compromise provisions such as here are places where you're not going to be able to have an ADU. Here are places where you can have a 1,200 foot ADU. Here are places where you're limited to a 900 square foot ADU, all based on a genuine observation of what the e ingress and egress of the neighborhood is like and how likely it is to be a fire Last danger. Week, when the fire liaisons that uh, work for uh, Susan came up and, and explained to us that there were all these streets that you couldn't get out of, okay, it, the decision that says keep it to two roads came up came up pretty quickly. Uh, we said safety is, a, safety is our most important issue. And somehow that's gone out the door. But at tonight. the same time, we don't have the public here. And 
I'd like to have at least one more round where people have a chance to uh, hear what we've talked about and put the input in and make sure we've got a consensus bill. Thank you very much. Joe, you're up. Could you please play this? And they've, they've got 90 seconds more of a video, and then I'll talk. Okay, three minutes. <laughs> three minutes. But here, um, I think we need to do a little bit more outreach before we make such a drastic impact to property owners um, by doing that. I think we just, there aren't enough people that are aware of it or have voiced their opinion to that. So I think we really need to see the Maldi population and where they stand on that. Having one way in, one way out would be a terrible uh, issue for those people that were in Topanga or Big Rock. So I am concerned about this and adding additional residents. Let's have some good, solid reasons if we're going to make changes and why we're doing that, which I didn't think we got this time around. So. Let me just uh, maybe give you guys some direction. I think the question about two ways in and out is an issue. Yeah. If the height uh, is an issue. I think consistency on square footage is an issue. To me, or, you know, defining an ADU versus a uh, uh, junior ADU versus a guest house, almost to the point of, I'd love to have a matrix on that for simplification for everybody going forward. Um, I think we've already resolved the ownership issue. It's not an issue because it's illegal in the future. And um, as far as reporting for rental income, probably doesn't make any sense since it's supposed to be for uh, uh, gross income of the occupant, not the rental income. So I think those are the things I would consider to be open items. So in my last 90 seconds, one, you're going to make it easier to get an ADU over the current CDP requirements for a second unit or guest house. You basically only need an administrative permit review to get an ADU. So please do not approve any ADU law or limit these to homes not in canyons like Big Rock, Las Flores, Trancas, etc. Point Doom was almost completely burned out, so keep that in mind for two egresses also. PCH is actually the one and only egress in and out of Malibu, so this should already disqualify us from participating as per Jack Ainsworth. We are a unique city this way. Two, we have the data through our public safety department showing that it is dangerous and will become bottlenecked on PCH and all these tiny windy roads in an evacuation. It took over five hours. That will risk residents' lives in a wildfire if you have more density and people trying to get out. And finally, three, there's no one here. You talked about everybody knowing about this and no one knows about it. No one knows what's happening at City Hall. It's your job to keep residents safe. You have the tools and the arsenal with us being in a very high fire, fire hazardous severity zone. So please use them and remember what you all were saying at the beginning of the last meeting hearing on this and at the very least, keep the two egress requirement in there. Portola Valley was able to do this after review from the HCD in their very high fire hazardous severity zones as they submitted studies that we should also have. We also do not want to cause a proliferation of ADUs. If someone has a special circumstance like aging parents, a disability, et cetera, then you can make a provision like the city of Oakland has done with the ordinance to allow a structure of say no more than 900 square feet and no higher than 16 feet for them as an ADU. But they need legitimate reasons. Thank you, Joe. Thanks. All right, any hands? There are three hands. First is from Jamie Francis. Jamie, you're on. Thank you, good evening, City Council. City Council, I just want to say that I have been invested in this issue, as well as the housing element for 11 plus years, with five iterations of City Council members rotating. And here there has been no resolution to affordable housing contingency plans in this city. And now you're faced with approving an ADU or those structures or existing structures to implement reasonable housing assessment needs. When is the city of Malibu going to realize you are literally devoid of any affordable housing? I understand homeowners who say egresses, ingresses, we can't control wildfires. Well, that's all communities in the Santa Monica Mountains, from West Hollywood all the way to Malibu and above. So I just feel it's so adamant that the city has not found any resolution that now the state has to say you are objectively failing with implementing any type of housing. And this is market rate housing or people who are median income. What about low income? There is no Section 8 housing or landlords or viable apartments in your city. That this would be a moot point or possibly wouldn't even be an issue. 
but you have owners saying maybe in the canyons, yes, well, we don't need to have ADUs in the canyons, which is obsolete depending on homeowners who just worry about their families and those people they know and their immediate family. But Pacific Coast Highway and places that are built, that are commercialized, it is automatically required. And how have you failed this? I wonder how this city has been able to kick this down the road with five different councils in the last decade. It makes no sense. You are finding excuse after excuse after excuse. And I am, I'm just adamant about this, that I'm wasting my time and energy in a decade to say, you know what, maybe I eventually can move into Malibu. Here I started 30s, 40s, now I have to wait till my 50s. When is there going to be a realization that I could be on Section 8 and live in the city? But no, people are like, Section 8? What is that? Well, if you had Section 8 policies in place in your ordinance, there wouldn't be an issue about finding low-income housing or then having to make uh, get special permission to live in a city. That is ridiculous, sounding like the previous resident that just spoke. I don't need permission. I don't need some kind of doctor's notice in order to, or, or just have to know somebody that lives in the city. That's discriminatory. But then you, you would basically be facing and confronting discriminatory housing practices. When are you going to find it and to put in your ordinance that this has to be state law and municipal law? And that not only ADUs, but Section 8 apartments that have to be viable and, and provided by the city or built with the city ordinance and the city municipal codes to help developers or the city partake in city housing and affordable housing. How is that not having the 40 years that this city has existed? That is reprehensible. Because you know why? It's because of people who are adamant and different, didn't care, and it's ridiculous. Thank you, Jamie. Your time's up. Next hand, please. Next speaker is Ryan. Ryan, you're on. Ryan, you out there? Ryan, you are unmuted. Who's there next hand? The next hand is a call-in user, but sometimes that's Ryan, too. <laughs> My backup plan, I guess, is necessary. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We're going to change the rules here real okay. quick. Go ahead. <laughs> what I'm saying is that the, um, the two ways in and out for uh, accessory dwelling units is a necessary requirement, and you need to establish the evidentiary criteria and the data to achieve that as a requirement for a city ordinance. And it's a bit odd that the Department of Housing um, wants to interpret uh, Malibu Development Code as completely uh, inapplicable if there's any single provision in it that it disagrees with. I, that doesn't seem to make a lot of legal sense. I'd like the legal scholars to dis, debate that in a way that I could understand it. Um, it's usually a, even more restrictive is allowed and so forth, but um, they want to independently review and certify Malibu's municipal code for conformance in advance on their own interpretation. And it's sort of a mother may I um, situation. Well, it, it uh, Zeb Yaroslavsky once said it's like negotiating at a, a Middle Eastern bazaar. If you don't know what, what you're, you're negotiating against or with. So what they turn around and would say is, well, that's what you applied for. So why, why would you be ever challenging it or want to change it in the future? So that doesn't make a lot of sense. The North Area Plan has uh, alternate access to go north or go south through the canyons. Um, so the other is to not have the owner occupancy requirement would be to allow multifamily zoning where there's no, uh, no primary residence, a single family residence to an owner occupied situation. So lastly, I'd like to say the 900 square foot uh, limit is practical for an additional dwelling unit and that keeps them affordable and from becoming three bedroom second homes on a property, which is really a subdivision. I've lived in 900 square feet for 30 years, and of the 
70 of the units at my condo complex are smaller than 900 square feet, and it is completely possible to live within 900 square feet for two large bedrooms and two full bathrooms and a living room and a dining room and a kitchen. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Anybody else? Those are all the raised hands. Okay. Uh, with that, I will close public comment, bring it back up to the council table. Anybody want to start? But let's, let's try and do it by P. Let's talk about the two-way access first and see if we can get some consensus what we want to do with that. Paul, you would like to start then? I, I was convinced at the last meeting that the two access requirement is not, uh, is not going to fly. I think the 20-foot access that we talked about and is, that's in these things will fly, and that's where I stand on that one. Why won't the two-access way fly? Well, we, we hear, have heard that one community made the appropriate findings that it would to make it fly, but everybody else has been turned down. Is that correct, Joyce? Um, staff uh, has a letter dated August 4th, 2023, uh, regarding uh, Portola Valley, and uh, HCE has rejected their ordinance. Uh, it's eight, eight pages uh, with it. It's I, I could read the chapter where they talk about the uh, one means of access, but it's uh, complicated because it refers to subdivision A, subdivision E of the government code, um, but they do not have a, uh, approval from HCD. So Portola Valley, although they, they proposed it that way, they got rejected. Um, yes, on, on numerous, okay. not, not just access, on, on numerous reasons. Okay, so if, if we're going to all do that one, that's fine. If not, I'll go on. I'm just on. trying to understand the, the reason why you say it won't fly. I mean, I've got a letter from the Housing De Community Development that says uh, you, you can't, you, areas due to lack of two ve 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 vehicular means of egress without making the necessary findings to justify with that restriction. So as long as we can justify the restriction, HCD apparently will accept it. So I'm still trying to understand why you think it won't fly. We're, we're not, I'm not sure where the hell the city is you talked about, but we're not there. I, I, I think that the, the answer to that question is that no one else has been able to get two accesses, a minimum of two accesses uh, accepted by HCD. That's not true. Is that not right, Joe? Just something, one city got it, right? No. No, no city has gotten that restriction. And, and um, Portola Valley does not have that restriction. Each, each city has a, a, you know, that we are discussing has um, access provisions, but none of them are um, two means of uh, cool. access. None of them are identical to uh, what the county ordinance um, and what is before the council tonight. There's always a first. Okay, Marianne? I'm not in favor of that because we're going to be taking away rights that current property owners have under the Municipal Code and Local Coastal Program with the second residential units. So, unless... They can, they can build the second residential unit, right? We're not taking Could someone orders. explain to me the difference between a second residential unit and an ADU? Uh, currently, our... The way our code is written, second units encompass what we would call an ADU. So they're one and the same in terms of our code. So we're essentially removing rights, property rights, from our property owners that they enjoy now, but will not be able to enjoy if we put the two means of that egress on their on our uh, municipal code and our local coastal program. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. All uh, properties in Malibu uh, are currently entitled, assuming, of course, they have the total development square footage and don't already have a second unit, to a 900 square foot uh, second unit. Okay. And we're not taking that away from them? Uh, yes, we are. So we are doing away completely with second units. We are renaming second units uh, to accessory dwelling units. They're one and the same. 
Okay. Anybody on this side? Yeah, I'll uh, pipe in on this. When we first brought this up, this is one of the dangers of doing the legislation from the dais. Uh, it sounded like a good idea. We had just had the uh, uh, fire liaisons point out about box canyons and the difficulty there. And then I think the planning staff did an excellent job of coming back and telling us that 85% of the uh, properties in Malibu wouldn't comply if we had two exits in and out. And then you start to read the uh, responses and the latest one, the one from the county. Uh, and by the way, I appreciate everybody's research as uh, they have looked on the internet to get information, but if you don't read the whole document or you don't get the follow-up letters, you miss the responses that are coming out. And from what I've seen, every city has lost their argument for two ways in and out. And on top of that, we wouldn't be able to comply with this uh, state law that says you've got to have ADUs if 85% of the homes in the city or 85% of the properties are ineligible. So this is, I hate to use this phrase, but it's a fool's errand to go down this path. And there are other ways to do this where we're more logical about it. I can go into that, but we're asking me now about where we are on, on two, two ways in and out. Um, I, I, I want to have the safety aspects, but we're not going to get it this way. And we'd be better off trying to get something that's going to work on behalf of the residents as opposed to trying to something that we know is going to fail. I think we need to move forward with this ADU and get this uh, ordinance done. But I'm going to editorialize for a moment. I've only been on the council for a year. It's been floating around for five or six years. And what was probably appropriate five years ago, we seem to keep piecemealing together to come up with the ordinance we have tonight, which is, I'm afraid, always one step behind the, the curve of where it should be. We should, if we were doing this properly, we should already have an ADU ordinance in place and we should be talking about improving it at this session, let's call it phase two. So I'm more inclined to let's get this puppy in place now and then immediately get the corrections in there that we need to do to bring this to a modern ordinance that satisfies the current state laws and addresses the issues of safety, feasibility, and affordable housing. And I can go into that later as well, but uh, I don't think we can get this uh, two ways in and out passed by the state. Let's not waste our time on it. Let's get something productive done. And, and let me ask a question. You mentioned you've got other selection. I mean, this to me, this is a safety issue. So do you have other suggestions for how safety can be accomplished without the two-way access? Yeah. Uh, first off, the whole idea of the two-way access is to limit uh, concentrations of housing in various neighborhoods in the city. Isn't that what we're after here? It isn't about blocking it in, over the entire city. It's about safety issues of, and I've used Big Rock as an example, and sorry, Joe and the other Big Rock residents, but you're, you're sort of my poster child for this. One way in, one way out, high density area, and uh, limited uh, uh, exit routes even when you get to your main street and then down to PCH. So the question is, we've got, if you look at our general plan, we have 18 separate communities in the general plan. And we should be having uh, development for ADUs consistent with the area that they uh, are being proposed in. Right now, it's one size fits the entire city and what we're saying is, if you don't have one way in and one way out in a low-risk area, you're just as much penalized as a high-risk area. And I agree with Mary Ann, too. We're taking away a property right that these people have. So let's, this is where we should be doing phase two in this. We should be looking at these various neighborhoods and saying, what is the aesthetically appropriate thing to have in there? What's the feasible thing to appropriate to have in there? And what's the uh, uh, right design for that neighborhood, not everybody gets the same thing. So one way, one, one way in, one way out is, I think, just a peanut butter type spread of a rule across the city that isn't going to work with anybody. So you want to do specific ordinances for specific areas, different streets? Is that no, no, no. How not, are you going to deal with that? It's easy. You have, you have standards that talk about density of housing in the area. You talk about uh, uh, size of lots. You talk about the uh, uh, slope areas. You talk about the water tables. There's all kinds of requirements that are already in the LCP, but we can get these to apply. There's more than one way to skin a cat, in effect. You can get the safety density issue resolved by other means, and we just have to be smarter about it than trying to use a paint roller to do this. Bruce? I'm so torn on this. On the one hand, clearly less ADUs is safer for the city of Malibu than more ADUs. 
Um, I mean, that's a, that's a blanket statement, but it's, I, I think it's undeniably true. The less, less is better, and that's not in order to prevent affordable housing. Again, I, I, by the way, Mr. Francis, I actually agree with him that we should have affordable housing. We're just, and I said this last time, we're not going to accomplish that by allowing people to build 1,200 square foot ADUs on their property. It's not going to create any affordable housing. That, if anyone thinks that, that's, that's a joke. I'm not sure 900 square foot ADUs in Malibu are going to be affordable, qualify as affordable housing either. And I know we're talking right now about the two versus one entrance, but it's actually one big package. Um, to the extent that we're going to allow more of them, I'd want to, I'd, I'd seriously want to think about a rent limit or um, an income of the renter limit so that we actually are creating affordable housing and not just creating second homes on already second home properties for a lot of people. Uh, but I'm not concerned about going to the mat on two, on two entrances. I mean, I've made a career out of litigating nuances and new issues where people thought that the law was clear and it wasn't. And here we don't even have clear law. We just have, we have some opinions of HCD, which could be challenged in court, and we don't even know where they would come out if we presented a good argument to them about Malibu being special. And Malibu is special. We had a huge fire just five years ago, um, and we're entirely a high, high fire zone. And I know some other of these cities were high fire zones, but they didn't have that combined with the fact that they actually had the real fire that really wiped out a large portion of the housing stock in the city and could have been um, tremendous loss of life, too, if we weren't lucky. Um, I'd be shocked if they'd force Paradise to have a law requiring ADUs if Paradise didn't want to have more homes. But I, I think if I, I can tell where the council is going to come out on this, and I still think we shouldn't jump the gun. As I understand it, the worst case scenario is if we don't do anything yet, we may be bound by state law until such time as we do something. But if we do something now and it gets certified, we're stuck with that unless and until we can get to the point of changing it with the permission of the state. So I'd rather take a little more time and do this right. What I'd suggest is that doing it right, if we're not going to impose a two entrance exit throughout the city, would be to take a very hard and very specific look at every neighborhood and have a very nuanced code which addresses the specific danger of each specific neighborhood. Maybe if there's um, only X amount of road one way, I mean, if you take Big Rock as an example, you've got to go through a long winding area of one way to PCH before you get to PCH. Um, there are other, uh, you know, there are some there are some cul-de-sacs that are maybe six or seven houses in from the road, and it's it's a question of hundreds of feet, not not a half mile or a mile, um, that there be a possible bottleneck, and it's less likely that a street like that is going to cause a, pro a problem where people can't get out of their street. So maybe we need to take a more nuanced approach. But I I don't favor approving a general rule that I think is harmful now and then later seeing if we can get permission to carve it back because we're never going to get that permission. I'd rather live with the consequences of not having something in place right now. And our LCP is protective on that anyway because 90% of these things are not going to be built without getting going through the LCP, um, which isn't going to even be amended through Coastal for some, long, some period of time. But So I'd rather see us slow this down a little more I'm not advocating to kick it down the road a year or two, but I'd like to see a nuanced approach to which neighborhoods are a real danger and which neighborhoods are less of a danger. I mean, a lot of residents have, have said to me, it's not even the neighborhoods that's the issue, it's PCH that's the issue. I think Joe was saying that too. And I kind of believe we won't win on that argument, that, that we can't have um, ADUs in Malibu because everyone has to get off out of here on PCH, but I just think we need a more nuanced approach, and I, I, I hope that when we come out of here tonight, we're not going to have approved um, the broader approach. The, the other thing I'll say, and it's related again, is, is if we were going to approve it, I would implore you to stay with 900 feet and not go to 1,200 feet, because I think it's related. I think the larger the ADUs are, the more the danger is going to be. Okay. Marianne, you want to go? You got... I was just going to comment on the, the same subject. So we've got... Yeah, I, look, to me, this is all about public safety. 
I'm really not concerned about Mark Bowdy putting another ADU on his property to make more money for himself. I don't care. This is about our job. I believe our job is to protect the safety of the residents. And if I err on the side of caution, I err on the side of caution, but I save a life. How many lives am I supposed to save? Do we have to save to, to justify what we're trying to do? Doug, let me ask you a question. Big Rock. There's a fire in Big Rock coming down. The fire is blowing west to east, hit Big Rock. How long is it going to take the people in Big Rock to get out of there? I think you've missed the real meaning of the Big Rock issue. It's already so dense, you're probably not going to be able to get another seven. No, 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 no. How no, long no, will it take to oh, get Just answer the question. No, How long will it take? You're no. on the Public Safety Commission. Yeah. So you guys have studied this stuff. It How long will it take me to get the residents of Big Rock out of there so they're not going to be injured by the fire? That's the question. I don't have an answer for you on and that. And that's exactly I, the, that's the answer. I, we don't know. And that's my problem. Let's take Point Doom. How many houses burned in Point Doom last year? How long is it going to take those residents to get out of this fire? You don't know the answer to that one either. This I'm saying a, we are making a, decisions without having basic information that intelligent people would want to have to do this. And that, that's wrong. I mean, th th we're supposed to be smart people. We're supposed to be dealing with issues that, again, protect the community. And we're willing to say, oh, yeah, you know, I, it, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work. We'll let somebody else figure it out. Let me ask another one. You know, there, there, I read an article about uh, houses that are closer, houses that are closer to each other burn more quickly than houses that are far apart. So if I've got an ADU next to another house, I've increased the risk of fire. Do you believe that? Doug? Depends on what it's built out of. No, that just, no you don't believe that's, that? No, you've got to read the whole report. I did read the whole report. Matter of fact, it's a report that the city, the city of Malibu puts out. It's from the National Fire Protection Association. It's part of our instruction that we provide residents dealing with home, home building, and we tell them, as part of that report, that if, they're ho if putting houses next to each other increases the, the, the propensity that those houses are going to burn. Uh, how, so how close do we want to have ADUs to additional houses to prevent that from happening? Do we know? Anybody got an answer up here? My point is, guys, we need information. Making decisions without good information is criminal, criminal. We're risking people's lives. And we're saying, uh, you know, somebody wants to build an ADU, fine. But let's make sure we're protecting the residents. Mary Ann, go ahead, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I think some of the things we need to keep in mind are, yes, the fact that people can apply for a second residential unit under our current code. People can also do the build up to the maximum allowable square footage on their properties. And they could have six licensed drivers on that property, all within one single family residence. Or another property is going to build a smaller main residence and have a second residential unit, and they're only going to have three licensed drivers on there. So I don't think that the ADUs necessarily equate into more drivers emanating from a single family residence. Um, the other thing, you know, we learned a lot of lessons from Woolsey. We learned a lot of evacuation lessons from Woolsey. We've had more cooperation with our partners in law enforcement and other um, safety personnel for evacuations. We've got much uh, more robust evacuation procedures and uh, just a better way of protecting our neighborhoods and our families and such. The building code also improves over and over from every year and almost Every home in Malibu, well, every home now that is built is required to have fire sprinklers in it. The Los Angeles County Fire Department reviews every plan. They make the safety requirements, uh, the walk around, the requirement for hydrants within a certain amount, pool hydrants if they have a pool. So there's a lot of things that are put in place to help protect homes. Um, but like I said, the biggest thing is, one, it's already in our code that we allow people to apply for a second residential unit, and ADUs are effectively the same thing. There are some nuanced changes of things, but essentially the same. Also, ADUs can be um, carved out from the existing square footage of a home. So somebody could have an ADU out of an existing 3,000 square foot home. They could just convert 500 square feet and have a junior ADU within that. 
and you aren't going to notice any difference on the exterior of the home, but you've added another unit in there. So I think this is something that we need to get finalized. It's, it's time for us to move this along to the next state and get it to the Coastal Commission, get our LCP amendment certified, get our MMC updated. And as Doug said, when things come up, then either this council or a future council can look at the situation and make a determination what modifications need to be made at that time. But I think that it, it's time for us to move this along. This has been five years in the making and we need to move on. Hey, telling us it's time to move it along is not a reason for me to do something that's, not, that's wrong. All right, I mean, I don't care how long it takes us. If it's wrong, it's wrong and we should not do it. Uh, so. Okay, uh, let me kind of go through my, my speech on this. Um, if you look back over the last, well, since we first saw this in this uh, Council 17, for those who don't know it, this, we're the 17th Council for the city. Um, I think it was about three or four months ago that the staff brought us the ADU ordinance, did a side-by-side, -side, and it was very compelling. Uh, I had some problems with it, and I said, gee, um, I, this, this has been going through the grinder for so long, I would have to take comfort in the fact that other people have looked at it and where we are today is not a bad spot. I don't like some of the parts of it, but then the more I looked at it and the more we talked about it, the more I'm going, I got a problem with this, I got a problem with that. For instance, I don't like the idea of having two-story ADUs. I don't like the idea, and one of the reasons for that is you start having view impediments. I don't like the idea of having ADUs that uh, are visible eyesores to the community. You can put too many, you can put an ADU in a large property, say it's one of our R20s uh, zoning, you'll never see it. But on the other hand, if you put it in an area where the houses are densely packed together and you can squeeze one more ADU in, that doesn't necessarily fit the neighborhood uh, characteristics that the neighbors want. So this gets back to my, you know, where do you, where do you have the, the distinctions of what is acceptable in one neighborhood versus another? So, I was, I was willing to live with it, then I wasn't. I was, really to cancel, I was willing to vote no for this thing tonight, then I was willing to vote yes, but then with restrictions. And I'm kind of, and here's where I'm ending up on this. I agree with Mary Ann. We've, we've cooked this for long enough. It's, it's already obsolete in my mind. And our choice is we either send it back to the Planning Commission and say, let's clean this up to a modern day process, which could take gosh knows how long, or we, touch this up to make it as compliant as we can be with what we think the law is right now. And I'm going to ask Joyce or Trevor or Todd some questions on this in a second about how the process will work on approval. But we really need to get right back in and say this is what we need to fix on the ADUs. Because I agree, and Steve and I uh, don't disagree about the safety aspect, we disagree about the process. And as I mentioned, there's ways to make, and I'm going to use Big Rock again, Big Rock will probably never put ADUs as standalone ADUs or connected ADUs as an expansion of a house. There's just not enough room. You don't have the septic. You don't have the slide area. On and on and on. But there will be junior ADUs, as Mary Ann said. You're going to take a five-bedroom house and you're going to make two bedrooms an ADU and there'll be more people living in it, but it was already there. You're not going to change it very much. And the other thing to keep in mind, so far for the last five years, we've had two new ADUs per year added to the city inventory. Get that, 10 over the last five years. It's not like we've got a whole bunch of people standing here waiting to put something up. We're trying to do this to address it smartly and comply with the law. Which brings me to the next part of what I want to talk about. Let me just lead this off with the lesson learned and then I'll tell you why I brought it up. Over at Calabasas, we all know the, the Regal Theater, Regency Theater, I'm not sure what its name is, at the Calabasas Commons. Caruso just announced, with the blessing of the city of Calabasas, that they were gonna tear out the uh, theater and replace it with 120 apartment units, of which 12 will be low income. Now, if you've looked at all at low income housing, it usually is built as part of a multi-complex, multi-family complex, where the uh, market rate units subsidize the construction of the, of the low income housing units. The city of Malibu right now, in its lower income tier, we got 79 total required, and somewhere around 50 is what you need to be in compliance with the low income side. And yes, we don't have to have the units built 
this round with the state, but the next round they're going to go, well, you set this land aside, but nobody took advantage of it, so here's what we're going to make you do. And the way to, the way to build low-income units is to have large multifamily complexes. So take a Caruso ratio, you want to have 50, you got to build 500. 500 additional apartment units in order to get 50 low-income units to satisfy the state law. Malibu is not a 500-unit uh, neighborhood. This is a rural area with open spaces. What's the, what's the slickest way to get low-income housing satisfaction is to let people have their housekeeper, their grandmother, their um, you know, son that is trying to get a job in acting, live in their guest unit, pay rent, and meet the requirement for low-income housing. It can be done. So instead of, and yes, there's a 15% limit, but you know, the city of Malibu is a unique, unique story for this, the housing community development. If we play our cards right, we can apply to have these ADU units, ADU units in process to satisfy the next round, which is coming out, I believe, in 26, that you've got to satisfy the low-income housing requirement. Let's not, let's not box ourselves into a box that says the next council, number 18 or 19, is going to have to live with a mandate to put 500 apartment units in this town. That's not what we want. What we want is Malibu to look like Malibu. And one of the ways to do this is to have the ADU component be one of the sources of low-income housing for us that people are willing to have in their backyard. Now, it's that, it's a safety issue, it's about density, it's about aesthetics. We can do this a lot better than what we got on the table right now. But just saying that we want to postpone it or kill it or whatever, yeah, let's get this, let's get this thing passed clean it up as much as we can, take out the uh, owner occupancy requirement, which isn't legal, and get, get the you know, two ways in and out off the, off the table, and let's get smart about this. And it needs direction from the city council back to the planning commission. We need to be having this session up here going, we like this, we don't like this, get options and say, this is how we want to structure this. But let's get this thing fixed as soon as we can and I want to go to Joyce or Todd or Trevor. Let me go through the process to make sure I got this right. HCD requires us to have the MMC be state law compliant, right? All right. I got a head shake from uh, Joyce. Yes. All right. For the local coastal plan, the local coastal plan trumps the state law. Is that what we're saying or not? Uh, that That is correct. Trevor, you want to? Way in on that. Yeah. So long as a is a um, coastal development permit is required. So for I think an internal JDU, it. it not oh no! I, it, but not. But just in general, it does the, trump it if if, there, if it applies. The both. state the state law is uh, not in place. It defer, it defers to the local coastal plan, but the state local state coastal commission has said, and they're mandated I think to this to be as much compliance as they can with the state law. So whatever we send to them is going to have to go through the same filters as though it was a state law review, correct? I would disagree with that. You know, there's been some loose guidance from the Coastal Commission that um, efforts should be, you know, made to um, bring in the spirit of the state law. Right. But every local coastal program applies to um, the local conditions in Malibu and the, the application of what they're reviewing, they don't review for housing with, uh, or compliance with the state housing law. What they'll be reviewing is whether it's compliant with our land use plan and the Coastal Act. Which so they're me, looking at whether it's protecting coastal resources and public access. Which gets me back to what I was saying about every neighborhood should be a separate review. That's where we get our, our uniqueness out of this. and we. We end up with, and I'll use the beachfront properties as an example. I don't believe we're allowed to have ADUs on beachfront property. Is that correct? Multifamily. Uh, multifamily or beachfront? Yes, they, uh, they, they are allowed yeah, well, um, yeah. on beachfront properties. Okay. Right. Assuming they're most of the beachfront properties, as you're aware, there's, it would be difficult, I think, to attach a unit. Um, Mm -hmm. Maybe on a top of a garage or something like that is the only thing I can think of. A, that would be a junior ADU. Right, inside okay. of a building. Yeah. Right. All right. But I think I, that's why we need to think about the heights also. That's how you get back to the height. And this is, this is where we need to be smart about this and give direction to planning commission. As I look back to on the record, I don't think the city councils in the past have said much more than send it back to the planning commission, let them work it out, and send us something. 
I think we've been uh, deficient in our duties. So I'm going to recommend that, and I'm not making this a motion yet, but I'm trying to see if we got a consensus. And I haven't, we haven't heard from Paul, we haven't heard from everybody else yet, um, that we take the existing, or what's on the table tonight is, a, is an ordinance and all the components. We take out the two ways in and out. We take out the owner occupied, and we send this to Coastal to get their comments back on it, because that's when we're really going to approve the ordinance is when we get it back from Coastal with all their recommendations. If I'm correct. So that's that's my suggestion, and I'd love to see if we've got a consensus. Bruce, all right. So I, Doug used the, Doug used the term "need to be smart," and I agree. We need to be smart. Um, I'm ordinarily in support of when you need something done legislatively, adopt an ordinance that makes sense, and then you can work on fixing it down the line. You can, you can refine it. Do the minimum you have to do. Um, do something that, that essentially works, it, works quickly, and then consider whether it can be tweaked or needs to be tweaked. The problem with this is it, that's ordinarily, if, if we adopt an, an ordinance with, with respect to fireworks, we then have the liberty to decide what to do with it a year later or two years later. We can make changes on the fly. We're locked in once we get something approved. We have to get permission to approve it. This isn't just our municipal code. It's a municipal code that's subject to HCD. It's an LCP that's subject to Coastal Commission. Once we get their approval of our experimental baseline, we can't make any changes to our baseline, even, no matter how much we think they're necessary, without getting permission to make those changes. And there's absolute discretion to say no, which is why I think it's critical that we do this right from day one and not rely on our ability to amend it down the line, because we may not ever have the ability to amend this once we start. So. I, I don't support approving this tonight. I don't support approving it, with those changes or without those changes. I don't support approving this because I think we still have more questions open than we have answers. The 15 percent limit, the, 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 the argument that ADUs will help us with the um, low cost housing requirement, if we could use one for one, every single housing, every single low cost housing unit that we needed could be um, replaced by an ADU, could be qual an ADU would qualify. I would say that's a great argument. I would agree with that. But it's 15 percent. So if we need 50, we're allowed to use 7.5 of the ADUs. Let's maybe it's eight of, of the ADUs of however many people build to satisfy that. And we're still stuck with needing another thir um, 40, 43 or 42. Um, so you're still going to need that 500. Um, houses. Maybe you don't need 500 houses. You know, you maybe need 450 units or 400 units. So that's. That's, to me, that's minuscule. That's not worth approving something that may not work. Uh, Mary Ann made the point about we're, we're in a better place today. I, I'll just try this. I, I don't think I'm going to be surprised, but maybe I will. Anyone here who thinks they know a better way to evacuate than they did five years ago, could you stand up? I'm talking about the people in the audience. Okay, three of you. Thank you. Anyone here, how many of you think we're in a much safer city today than we were five years ago if a fire comes through the far, through the hills? Keep standing up. <laughs> okay, another three people, and one of the persons who said, thought they had a better evacuation route didn't stand up for that one. That so, oh, I said stand up, please. Uh, you can't, okay, so maybe there's five or six people here. But I, I don't think we're in much better position today than we were five years ago. We, we understand the danger a lot more acutely than we did five years ago. And we're doing what we can to make it safer. Um, but I don't think people understand how to get out of here better. In fact, I'm not sure there is a better way to get out of here than there was five years ago. And I'm not sure how many people feel much safe, much safer. And I'm not sure how much safer we really are. So I, I don't buy that as a reason to disregard the safety issue. Um, so I'm, I'm just not prepared to approve this, but again, I, to the extent there's going to be three votes to do so, I would strongly encourage you to keep it to 900 square feet. Doug made the point that in the past five years, there have only been 10, I think it was, or yeah, five years there have been 10. So that's under the existing law. To the extent that the new proposal more closely models the existing law, the less likely there is to be overdevelopment. So if you, we don't know what's going to happen if we open it up to 1,200 square feet. The, the last thing is, oh, and this is a question for Trevor. Um, it's my, 
a couple questions. First of all, it's my understanding that as of today, the state, if we don't, because we don't have anything further in place that complies with the state law, we're at risk when it comes to things that aren't governed by the LCP, that state law is the default, right? That's correct. Okay, but we're not at that same risk with respect to things for which you need a CDP, for which the LCP governs? If a CDP is required, it'll be processed under our current LCP as a second unit or a guest house is applicable. Okay, right. So the state law doesn't default with respect to development that requires a CDP right now? It doesn't supersede it, um, the local coastal program requirements, so that would be, you would need to meet those requirements. Okay. That Good. supersedes the... Okay, so, 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 as, so a week ago, if somebody wanted to build an ADU that requires a CDP that's governed by the LCP, they'd have to comply with the LCP. They couldn't point to something in the state law that's an easier way to build it and say, I'm, I get the benefit of that. Correct. Okay, and today that's the same thing. That's, that's the same thing. Some people argue that they don't need a coastal development permit. That's part of the litigation we're in in the Riddick case. Right, but, but that's just whether they need a permit or not. If they need a coastal development permit, then the LCP is the rule. Yes. Okay, so if we were to leave here tonight and approve only an MMC and not even set forth an LCP amendment, that would still be the way it works, right? Yes, the current rules would still be in place. And a year from now, if we don't have an amended LCP, in the absence of a change to the state law that, that from what it is now, our current LCP would continue to govern, right? Correct, yep. So, so we don't need an LCP amendment. We may or may not need an MMC amendment, and if we don't have one, I'm not sure how much worse the state law default or supersede is to the one we have, but it will only apply to junior ADUs and what, what's the other one? Well, there's an argument that it would apply to attached ADUs. If okay. the Riddick's are successful, right. any attached ADU would then go under the municipal code. That's the, that's the Riddick case, which, I'm a, which, which even if we lose at the Court of Appeals, we can try to get the Supreme Court to decide otherwise. That's correct. Okay, but one way or the other, we don't need an LCP amendment. So again, at the risk of locking ourselves into something that would be imprudent, I would encourage the council to, at minimum, not vote for an LCP amendment tonight. Limit the vote, if there's going to be one, to the MMC. I think the MMC is going too far, um, but you know, I know I understand that it's going to be a three-two. It's 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 going to be a three-two vote at the end of the night. The only question is whether it's going to be three-two in favor or three-two against. I suspect it's three-two in favor. But I'd encourage you to make it as limited as you can, consistent with the law. I'd encourage you to consider. Um, rent limits or um, whatever the limit is that, that tests the, the um, person who rents it to see whether it qualifies for the low income, because if it's not going to qualify, that doesn't even get us to 7.5 units. Um, I would limit it to 900 square feet. I'm not sure 20 feet, if you're only going to have one entrance, is good enough. I think there's a lot of nuance here that ought to be considered, but at a minimum, limit it to the MMC. Don't do anything with the LCP yet. Let's get more information. Let's be smarter, which is something both Doug and uh, Steve always say. Hey, Paul? I don't know about if I'm smarter, but I'm older. And because I was older, I was sitting in this room when previous city councils decided that they could punt on a coastal, on a coastal plan and punt repeatedly and delay getting their coastal plan done. And guess what happened? The Coastal Commission ended up writing our coastal plan for us. And that is not what I want to happen here, for starters. Uh, as far as the changes that the document we have in front of us needs, uh, it talks about having a rent audit. The, the law that we're trying to make happen here, we're trying to satisfy low income homes. And that, to qualify that, they have to, their income has to be a certain amount of the median amount in, the, in, the, in our area. So you, we don't, I don't care what we charge them for rent or if we charge them no rent at all. We need to have people who are low income move into these things. And so that is something that will be required in order for us to be able to fill out the forms on those 12 or however many. And I also don't understand how you guys think we're going to get away with, with 50 units instead of the 80 they're asking for. So maybe somebody can explain that to me when I get done. The other thing is 
I think that, you know, people are saying, well, Coastal is said we don't have to. Well, Jack Ainsworth wrote us a letter that said we don't have to because we're in the coastal zone. And within six months, he wrote us another letter after the legislature and the governor had a chat with him that said, oh, wait, you do have to do that. And those those the succession of letters from Jack Ainsworth are actually in our file here. And he and everybody else says we we should have this and have it in our local coastal plan. And we have a local coastal plan amendment that we're working on right now. And this is part of that. So I would advise that we do this. And I know that Doug had something to say. So I'm not going to make a motion right now. I'm going to let Doug speak. And then I'll make a motion. I just want to clarify, uh, answer your question. I did some research on this low income uh, aspect. And uh, surprisingly enough, you say it's for low income housing. It's actually not based upon the income of the, of the tenant. It's based upon what the rent is. And the rent is uh, a percentage of the median income at various levels. And the re where I got the 50 versus the 79 is there's tiers for that number. And I believe 47 are to be the very low income housing at the lowest uh, rent level. And that's the reason why it's subsidized housing, uh, uh, or not subsidized housing, but the, the uh, uh, market rent units have to subsidize the low income units because they can't charge enough rent to cover the actual cost of the units. That's the reason why it's for Caruso, 120 units, and you get 12 uh, low income. That's, I was just trying to answer your question. Thank you. you know, I think this dream of making these things low income housing is a dream. It's a dream. Uh, Airbnb has now started a separate company where they're going in and building ADUs in your yard for you, okay, so they can turn them into short-term rentals. This is, this, this is going to be a process to make money. Let me ask you, how many people here live in Malibu? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, lady right here, the second one, the second row. I don't know. I don't know what's your name. Pamela, uh, what evacuation zone are you in? Uh, no, what? Yeah, what evacuation route zone? So, huh? Uh, Pam, Pamela, at me, so Pamela, 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 Pamela. Okay. The point is. This is my cousin. Yeah, this guy's right. Okay. <laughs> the point is this: we do not have a warning system. We don't have one. Right, we don't. We don't have. We're processing getting one. We don't have one today. We got people. Five people raised their hands and said, uh, "Evacuation is going to be quicker." But I'm guessing the rest of you wouldn't know your, your evacuation zone if your life depended on it. Okay, uh, this is all about safety. It's about safety. And, and the other thing that's interesting to me, Doug. I mean, if I in business, if I had gone to my board and said, "I want to pass a plan." But the plan I got is, no, is not going to work. It's not good, all right. So, but I want you guys to, to uh, uh, do it now, and I'll come back a week from today, or two, two days from today, or a week, a month from today, and fix it for you. My board would have said, "Get the heck out of here. Do it right the first time, or don't do it." Why is it? Why is? Uh, can we make decisions in the municipal government that are different than what we know would work if we're in, in a commercial business someplace? Why is that better? By the way, that's uh, what happens all the time in business is you do what you have to do immediately. You look at uh, uh, like SEC filings, and I'll tell you from a bank regulatory point of view, quite often we'll prepare an interim report, file it, and then come back and do a, a well, complete report. And I'll tell you from a Fortune 500 company where I was a vice president, we didn't provide, we didn't do reports or make decisions that we didn't think were right. You don't do that. That's how, that's how you become a Fortune 500 company. Well, Just I, was, that's work. I was on a Fortune 500 company. Yeah. I was at Security Pacific Corporation as assistant treasurer, and we did. I was the number two issuer of debt for three years in a row. Okay. Anybody else? Marianne? So I wanted to clarify a couple things. We received a letter from Malibu Township Council regarding CEQA. And um, I just want to verify that this um, has uh, compliance with CEQA on both the Municipal Code and the Local Coastal Program Amendment? Yeah, it's it's covered in Section 2 in the ordinance, and I think it, in, it's like in number 510, I think a similar one is also in Ordinance 511. But this, uh, what we're proposing here is exempt for a number of reasons. The 
the proposed changes to the municipal code are exempt under uh, pursuant to state law and um, the work that we're doing as part of the LCP amendment is also exempt as part of the LCP amendment. Coastal has its own environmental process, which has been found to be um, comparable to the CEQA requirements. So um, it is in compliant with there. And then there's a number of other provisions as well. Any particular project or ADU that would be undertaken would also be subject to its own CEQA review. This doesn't authorize anything to be built itself. This is the legislative a portion of it so that review would come later. Okay, thank you. Um, also, during the video, there was a portion that said that only an APR is required, but for a, either attached or a detached new square footage would require a coastal development permit. It's only within the existing permitted square footage conversion that could be an APR. <laughs> Uh, y yes, uh, although it is um, mirroring again, uh, since we have to have the provision in the municipal code and be complete, it, it indicates that if a ADU were ever to be processed under the municipal code, it would be an administrative plan review. That's, okay. Yeah. But, but it will not because it will be processed under the. But new LCP. areas would be subject to a, a, an administrative coastal development permit. That is correct. Which is decided at the staff level and just reported to the Planning Commission? Uh, that is correct. It's uh, identical to uh, the current second unit process. Okay, great. Um, and the, with regards to the square footage amounts, um, are you talking about limiting the municipal code requirements to just 900 square feet? Because doesn't the state law state um, 850 and 1,000, depending on the amount of bedrooms? So I'm a little concerned if we adopt something that just says 900 when state law has different square footage minimums. Yes, the, the um, city would uh, need to comply with state law for the municipal code, which is the 850 and 1,000. The discussion, uh, I believe, uh, on size is for the LIP. But I think for consistency for the community to know if we just have a thousand straight across the board, that would be um, easier both for residents to understand and those applying for the applications and staff to be processing for consistency between the two documents. That is correct. Okay. Um, and the height, um, the 16 feet would actually be a reduction in the allowable height that they could currently apply for at 18 feet. Yes. And currently they can apply for a site plan review to get 24 feet for a flat roof or 28 feet for a pitch roof? That is correct. That is current code. Okay. Um, I mean, my recommendation is that we do allow units over the garage. Um, I think that that's something that people are going to um, possibly want to have. They're going to be subject to a site plan review in order to get that extra height. So any neighbors, um, they would... Um, have to comply with any of that. Does state law prohibit um, a denial uh, if they are proposing over, if they have a, uh, a site plan review? Is there any issue with that? So uh, state law only um, has the, they have um, sort of a, a stepping, so it starts at 16 feet, and then if, um, I think there's at least two, maybe three, uh, abilities to uh, move uh, higher, and one of them would be if you were attached to an existing house that was a certain height, and I could look up each one of those, but it, it allows you to um, base the height on the uh, what's uh, built on the property. Okay, I just don't want to be out of compliance and approve something that is subject to a different rule or something like that. So all of the um, it's my understanding and, and, and our recommendation is that the uh, discussion uh, <clears throat> with the council in terms of the height and size only rely uh, only um, would be in the LIP. That state law would rule in the MMC, which is the 850 and 1,000 and 16 up to 25. Okay. Bruce, Bruce, go ahead, please. It's a couple technical questions also. <coughs> Am I correct in understanding that it, whatever the square footage is, if it's 900 or 1,200, that's exclusive of a garage for the ADU? That's correct, right? Uh, that, is, <clears throat> that is correct. And yeah, it's no. also exclusive of a basement for the ADU? No. 
Uh, it would, habitable area would be included if it, a basement was habitable. So you could have a non-habitable basement that would not be included? I think the plan commission had, if I recall, I'll double check, but if the plan commission had the same uh, um, concern and we closed that loop. I, I think the, the language we're proposing tonight is habitable or non-habitable basement space. I'll double check, though. So basement, you, your understanding is basement space is excluded from, is included in the In the 1,200 or 900, yeah, okay. but not garages specifically. Okay, what else besides for garages can people tack on to their ADU that doesn't count as square footage? Nothing. Decks? No, not a, um, I mean, a deck that did not have a roof, but it wouldn't be counted as square footage. Right, that's what I'm asking. What else could they add yeah. that wouldn't be counted as square footage? Yeah, a deck or, you know, anything else that you can think of that wouldn't be counted as square footage. Okay. All right, thank you. I, I'm sorry, do I have a follow-up on that? It is, though, still included in the total development square footage allowed on the property. So It's all, a 400-square-foot garage or some other thing. That's correct. So every property still has a maximum amount of square footage that can be proposed on that based upon the rules in the LCP and the MMC. Right. And all this development has to comply with those right. requirements. So if, they, if their TDSF was maxed, say they only had 500 square feet left, then they would have to settle for a 500 square foot ADU and no, no garage in that, in that scenario. Unless but they, they converted some but other they still, of the But they still could have an unenclosed deck Right, because that's not counted as square footage. Okay, thank you. So, so why is it that a garage doesn't get counted towards the 900 or 1200 square feet for the ADU if the ADU has a garage, but the garage does count if it's part of the principal residence as well as counted towards the total square footage of the whole property? Yeah, so it's counted as square footage for the lot, but the, the language is mimicked in what currently exists. So the second unit provisions already allow for the same thing, a 400 square foot garage. And so we just mimic the same language. Can I ask you just a quick question about the square footage? We keep talking about 900 and I think the state law said 850 and 1,000 square feet. Is that the maximum or is that the minimum? And can you have like a 450 square foot ADU? Uh, no, <clears throat> that is the... I always pay the minimum, or it's the minimum maximum. Mi <laughs> it's 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 confusing. We cannot the minimum? Uh, go below that. If um, it's it's eight fifty for a one bedroom, you could not do seven fifty, uh, but you could do twelve hundred. Because you just somebody just said a five hundred square foot ADU. Junior, junior ADU. Junior ID, okay. Junior, yes. I realized the confusion because this came up at our last meeting because we said this is the minimum maximum. <laughs> what we did is we took the minimum of the state law and made that the maximum of our law. So that the idea is that the direction staff was given was not to, to open the barn door, so to speak. <laughs> so we are trying to keep them where they are. And so that's why when we say minimum maximum, it's because we looked at the maximum of what has to be allowed and set that, excuse, the minimum of what has to be allowed and set that as our maximum. Folks could always choose to build less. And so if they were to build a 500 square foot ADU, then we would term that as a, a junior ADU, correct? And, and fall into those provisions. But the, the goal here was not to give more than we had to. By the way, we still have the, uh, no matter what we do, we've got those 14 houses that were fire rebuilds that had the 1,200 square foot uh, units that we needed to grandfather no matter what we do. Is that correct? Those four, we, don't, we do not know how many of those 14 units still exist um, because they were applied for probably you know, within a year after the fire. Some of those uh, properties have probably already been um, replaced, and we do not know whether they kept their ADU on the, their temporary building or their temporary structure or converted it. But yes, there, there should be some that um, have the potential. None of them that have been final uh, because the code is not approved yet. So if somebody were to final 
their house and their second unit, they would have had to have a 900 square foot um, because we do not have a provision at this point that would have allowed them to convert it to 1,200. Okay, but what we're talking about are really those few people that use those as interim housing while their house was being built. So if we put something in that said uh, you can be up to 1,200 square feet if it's the remainder of the temporary housing while your home is under construction, so we don't allow them to put new 1,200 foot in. I don't know what the right language is. That's where we need Trevor. But, uh. I, I believe in your last staff report, or uh, maybe the first staff report, uh, we had um, language for the non uh, that would allow non conforming. Okay. So we just need to bring that language back then for those those okay. well, yeah. inter those few exceptions fire bills, right? Right. Okay. Bruce, Doug, is, is that leaning towards meaning limiting it to 900 square feet and not adopting the 1,200? As a general, because it doesn't, to me, it doesn't make sense to go for 1,200 just because we've got 10 or 12 that are 1,200. No, I, I'm just, whatever we come up with, if we do the 1,000 square foot, we've got these uh, few that are grandfather, I always use the word grandfather, yeah. but uh, <laughs> uh, pardon me, uh, the ones that are remnants of the transition between the temporary construction and the final home. Right, so we have to do something to make sure that they're legal non conforming yeah. properties, but we're not, but not sweep in everybody can go to 1200 square feet just because we've Correct. made the mis well, not a mistake but just because we've got 10 or 12 that are okay thank you all right anybody else we've been around this horn for a while now so go ahead paul i'd like to make a motion that we adopt resolution number 23-43 exhibit a approving lcp amendment number 18002 trevor how much of this do I have to read? All of it? <laughs> you can just move staff's recommendation and then let me read the title. I'll move so staff's recommendation. And then I'll read the title of Ordinance 510 and 5. I better get a second first. Well, the staff recommendation. Sorry, doesn't the staff recommendation say 1200? It does. And, and I just want to be clear that's what you want to move? Yes, that's what I want to move. And what about the two ways in and out? We, and the uh, that's provision. Not, that's out. That's I'm out. sorry, uh, uh, Mayor uh, Councilman Rigersanti does um, also include the definition for uh, guest houses as your, your motion. I do want to include that a, that guest house, no, no kitchen. kitchen. And then there's um, in the, in the code you have before you uh, is from the planning commission had the 20 foot wide street. Um, do you want to remove that and have? Um, I'm comfortable with 20 foot wide street. Yeah, so does that make sense? So the two means of egress is not in the proposal. In I'm front sorry? Of the two means of egress is not in the proposal in front of you guys. It's just that. the 20-foot wide. I understand okay. that. Guy. And what's the size of the house? 1,200. No, he's... Uh, for a two the bedroom. motion on the floor is 1,200. Yeah. For a two-bedroom. For a 2 I'll second that. Okay. Then, um, so, uh, Councilman Rogasanti, um it's 1,200 for a two-bedroom, um, as and for a one-bedroom. Gen generally, it's it's easier if we don't um, state law divides them by one bedroom and two bedroom. It's easier uh, to manage if there's just an upper limit. Okay. And as opposed to having to see whether somebody has um, a, a dividing wall and a closet. Exactly, I trying to stick so it. So maximum in allowable square yeah. footage, 1,200? Yes, that is, I believe that's uh, Councilmember Grisanti's motion. That is my intent. Thank you very much for no. elucidating that. Okay. That's in the current version. It is in the current, current. version. Okay. Then uh, if, if I could read the title of the ordinances. Is any other discussion before we go to the board vote? Uh, is it? Is there any interest, any interest in a friendly amendment? Do we have a second, by the way? Okay. Yeah, uh, do we have any interest in maybe capping this at a thousand square feet with a twelve hundred foot exception for the fire rebuilds? I would do that. I would rather leave it at twelve at twelve hundred if it's it says twelve where it says twelve hundred in here. If it brings more consensus, I could go to a thousand. I would prefer it at a thousand with the twelve hundred uh, uh, square foot exception. Then I guess I'm at a thousand. Okay. So the 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 fourteen temporary housing units 
could apply for the 1,200 permanent, but everyone else would be limited to a maximum of 1,000 square feet? Um, is that the motion on the floor? Yes, that's is that my understanding. Is, is it's been lowered from twelve hundred to a yes. thousand, yes. and then anybody um, that had received a temporary use permit um, up to twelve hundred um, could would be grandfathered in, and we could bring back that language. Let's, uh, let's put the language in tonight. I think Todd, Todd, can you clarify the the change that we're looking at here? Do you have that all staff right now? The change. Of size? Yes. It sounds to me like there's a proposal to go from 1,200 as an across the board size limit to down to 1,000 as an across the board size limit. Did I misunderstand? I think and that's correct. Mayor, uh, it's just uh, again, as a point of clarification, because it gets confusing because we're um, amending both the MMC and the LIP. So in the MMC, it would be the 850 and, and 1,000. In the LIP, um, the suggestion is it would be 1,000 plus a provision that would allow um, grandfathering in for the 14. Let's not use that term. And we have found the language, <laughs> the nonconforming language um, that I can read into the record and yeah, can you okay. can you uh, write the language that would be needed to address? You said there are particular um, residences that? that you want to allow to go to twelve hundred square feet. Existing nonconforming. We got some language here. Should we read it? Yes, if you have the language that would cover that. Uh, nonconforming provisions. Which, Properties uh, where, where impacted by the twenty-eight. Did, did, hold on, hold on. We need to specify where this is going. Is this adding a provision? Is this altering a provision of the <laughs> ordinance? Which ordinance we need to specify where this change is This, uh, the nonconforming provisions would be in the LIP. This is which ordinance? 510 five, or 511? That's 510. In 510, have, um, where? Tyler's going to, um, I believe um, we could add it to the size yeah. on page uh, 19 of the ordinance, and it could be... Um, so it would be in section, does that be on page 11 of 18? No. no. Yeah, you're right. It's eight, 18. 18. In, it's si in uh, page 19. section oh, yeah. large H, subsection 1 size, and you're going to add a subsection little e. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And can you read in the language read that it? would be? Okay. Uh, Non-conforming provisions, properties impacted by the 2018 Woolsey Fire that received a city permit for a temporary housing structure pursuant to LIP Section 3.6M uh, or MMC Section 17.40.040A18 may convert the existing legally established temporary housing to an ADU even if the temporary housing exceeds the square footage and limits established by this chapter. However, such a such an ADU cannot exceed 1,200 square feet, and the building permit for the construction of the temporary housing must have occurred before we had November 27, 2023, because so, that was when we thought the ordinance would be adopted. So this would be December 11th, December 11th 2023. Does that language uh, re reflect the change you were looking for? Yes, it does. Correct. Okay. Then we have that the um, motion was staff's recommendation with the changes as um, read into the record by uh, Ms. Uh, Parker Boslinski. And then the title of the ordinance, uh, number 510, is an ordinance of the City of Malibu approving local coastal program amendment 18-002, an amendment to the local coast program to update accessory dwelling unit regulations and zoning text amendment number 18-004, an amendment to title 17 zoning of the Malibu Municipal Code related to definitions, guest homes, and changing the term second units to accessory dwelling units and finding the amendments exempt from the California Environmental, Environmental Quality Act. And then ordinance number 511, the title reads, an ordinance of the city of Malibu approving zone text amendment number 18-004, an amendment to title 17 zoning of the Malibu municipal code to update accessory dwelling unit regulations and find the amendments exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Trevor, do we need to strike the owner occupancy requirements section? 
It sounded like that came up earlier today. Was that the is that the request from the? We, yes, since we were told that it's state law to not have it in there, let's not have it in there. Agreed. Sorry, that was in uh, ordinance. It was only in the municipal code ordinance, ordinance 511. Okay, so uh, that would then be struck as well. That would be in there when it comes back for a second reading. Trevor, before there's a vote, uh, Mayor and Council, I'd like to clarify on the record before there is a vote. I, well, clarify and apologize. I owe uh, Council Member Silverstein and the rest of the Council an apology. I misidentified the appropriate bill. Uh, the bill that I identified earlier was cross-chaptered with Assembly Bill 1033, and because 1033 was chaptered after 976, uh, the operative provision is um, Section 2.5 of Assembly Bill 1033, but it does the same thing. It incorporates the change. I just wanted to get that in the record. Thanks for clarifying the record, Todd. Bruce? Okay, so it's very obvious we're heading to a, like I said, a 3-2 vote. Um, I would just encourage Doug, if there are any other changes, whatever, that he thinks are appropriate, he's got the whip hand, because if he doesn't say yes, there's not going to be a 3-2, there's not going to be an affirmative vote, I would encourage you to make them. And among others, I'd encourage you to defer an LCP amendment tonight and just go with the MMC, because there is no negative consequence to the city of deferring that and getting it done better and more smarter, as you used the word before. Um, whereas we're being told if we don't do the MMC, perhaps we've got some default provisions. But there may be other things too that you discussed and if there's anything that's important to you, please put them on the table because the narrower the better. I appreciate that, Bruce. Uh, I think my approach on this is, as I said earlier, this is, we're rapidly moving toward the ADU ordinance that we should have had several years ago, and we should be amending that to bring it up to modern standards of what the law says today. Uh, and I'm going to encourage, once the vote is taken on this, if it passes, that we uh, assign however we do it, I don't know whether the, the, it's the city manager or the, uh, who, to come back and start giving us the corrections we need for uh, ADUs to be low-income housing, neighborhood-by-neighborhood uh, neighborhood, uh, type considerations. We need to bring this forward and clean it up. Um, we need to get something done, I think, sooner rather than later. It's been too many years. I appreciate Bruce's comment, but um, after three different uh, councils, we need to close this chapter and fix it going forward. We need to have a base to work from. I appreciate Bruce's comment, but I don't know that I can recommend anything that uh, uh, I would be comfortable with that didn't have a consensus built around it. Okay, let me just, if you're watching out there, pay attention to this, because we're, we're, you're watching how sausage is made, all right? Uh, and not only are we making sausage, we're making sausage which basically may risk the lives of some of the residents we live in here, and we're passing an ordinance we don't like. Right, we're passed an ordinance. We say we got to come back and fix it because what we got right now is not good. This is what you voted for. Okay, I'm sorry. Do we have? We got a motion in a second. If you want to call the question, you need a roll call. Councilmember Grisanti. Yes. Councilmember Riggins. Yes. Councilmember Silverstein. No. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Yes. Mayor Uring. No. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, do we need to do more than one vote on this? Before we leave this, I'd like to um, ask for a consensus to bring back uh, the improvements that we see necessary for this. I don't know whether it's the planning department. Uh, I would appreciate it if Joyce could stay involved in this on round two. And we started drafting uh, recommendations for the planning commission to come back with uh, updates. And if you look at the timing for this, the Coastal Commission, by the time they get back to us for, with their comments and by the time we get the next ordinance passed, it's going to be months. By the time we get through the correct, the phase two, as I'm calling it, it'll be a year from now. So let's, let's start on it as soon as we can, and I'm going to look to the city manager about how we might implement this, because I know you've got your plate already full, but uh, we need to fix this uh, somehow. 
I have a uh, answer to that, Mayor Pro Tem. So I would recommend that when we get through, uh, for example, let me back up. Right now we know there's a number of things right now that the city's not working on that we need to work on, and we don't have those identified in the current goals. So we, we actually have a list of those items. We call that our parking lot. Uh, and I would recommend that we'll put, we'll put this one in the parking lot. Uh, and then when we come back to talk about the goals again back in March, we'll, we'll address this as well as the other vehicles that are still in the parking lot. Uh, and we'll see if we can get some consensus and direction from, from the council to get that on the work plan going forward. Uh, thank you. I, and I'm not as pessimistic as others uh, perhaps on the dais about two things. First of all, I don't think this is a safety issue at all. Uh, we're not talking about packing the city with, uh, uh, you know, 500 units next week. At the current rate, uh, we'll have 10 more units in five more years. But the real issue here is uh, uh, about trying to do things smarter for future uh, use of this ADU ordinance as opposed to trying to fix what we have in place. So, And by the way, your parking lot, I'm sure, looks like it's uh, uh, Costco on a Saturday afternoon. Bruce? Well, first of all, I want to thank Doug for getting the size reduced because um, I think that's a helpful improvement. Um, I will join in a, con in a consensus to bring this back at some point in the future with, um, with a more nuanced approach. Um, I hope it comes out of the parking lot before Coastal approves what we're putting forward tonight and maybe even before HCD approves it because that will at least give us a chance to submit a revision before they approve it, which will take away their ability to deny our more nuanced changes. If it waits until after that, it's going to take us another year or two before we find out whether they'll even agree to further changes, and we should expect they won't. So where are we with the votes? We need a consensus. We need to see if there's a consensus for you back. Is there one more um, council member who would be interested in having that added to the parking lot? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should. I mean, when do we, we're going to have a second reading in this, and then it's going to go up to Coastal? Yes. Uh, uh, that is correct. And then how long do we expect that we'll get some preliminary comments from them or? Uh, generally, um, they have a, a very short window. I can't remember what, what it is to um, act, and they almost always uh, ask for a one-year extension. 90, 90 days, days is thank their you. very short thank you, thank you, Norm. It's 90 days. They have 90 days to respond to our um, application. They are busy, as the city uh, staff is as well, and so they almost always ask for a one-year extension. So I, I believe it will be a while before we get it back to them. Uh, we staff can work with Coastal. Um, this would be a year before it gets up to the Coast Commission, uh, but um, as, as you know, uh, one of the first steps is working closely with them uh, to make sure that they are satisfied. There is a possibility it will be approved and then come back with some suggested modifications, which the council would uh, consider at that time. Tracy, you have been in contact with them also, though, preliminarily about this also, right? I'm, I'm sorry? We have been in contact with coastal staff. Yes, already. we have been working closely they didn't with, any, with any comments or suggestions to change. Uh, this. They submitted uh, one letter um, uh, on parking and trying to um, uh, make it more consistent with state law. Yep, that was uh, we previously addressed that, right? Yes. Yep. So I'm hesitant to have staff working on modifications to this. We've got so many things as a community we want to work on and to have staff time taking up when we're going to be getting probably recommendations or nuanced changes from the Coastal Commission. Um, I'd really rather see staff working on community development of our vacant lots and some other things, and then once we get comments back from Coastal, then we can address uh, any modifications at that time. I agree with Mary Ann on that. Okay, uh, so it's withdrawing the request. Um, we'll, we'll deal with it when it comes back. Is that correct? Yeah, I think this, the staff timing is a critical issue. Uh, I do think it needs to be in the parking lot, but uh, let's see. Let's see what we have when it comes back. 
Ready. Ready to move on, or do we want to take a break before? What do we? We took a break. I just want to make sure that I got consensus that we're going to put that on the parking lot, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just we don't pave paradise to get there. Kelsey, did the vote get completed? Yes, the uh, vote was called and the motion did carry, so the council can move on to item 2A now for public comments for items not on the agenda. Got it. Any, do we have any speaker slips? Thank you. Is there a Red Chief Hunt? These things keep showing up. I don't know who that is. Okay. Uh, Tim Para, you're up first, followed by Norm Haney. So, Norm, you're up front. And then Graham. He just called the first three. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, respect, respectable council members. I'm a Ranger Tim with the MRC uh, report for uh, November. And um, what we did this uh, this uh, last month, we issued three administrative sites for smoking in the backcountry in the Escondido Canyon Trail, which was a good you know catch on that. And uh, we also issued four citations for dogs on the beach at Lechuza, Lechuza Beach. No encampments were observed in our parks as well. We also issued 247 parking sites for the month of our, and in our parks. No service calls were generated for this month. Uh, we continuously staffed rangers and public officers during the busy weekends for crowd control and public safety. And uh, this concludes my report for this month. Thank you very much. Tim, thank you. Any questions for Tim? I just have one question. Uh, Jefferson Wagner had, set, had sent us a public comment at one point that the parking citations that you're <coughs> issuing are on city property, not MRCA. Is, is that correct or incorrect? Um, we do, like uh, like at Corral Canyon, the Sarah Juan Trailhead, if someone's parked by on PCH by the fire hydrant, we do cite that. Um, so that would be like a, you know, uh, anything adjacent to our park, we can cite. So adjacent to, is that by statute or that's just because that's the way you do it? By statute, by, by, our, by, our, by the state. Could you, could you at, in a future point, identify for us the ordinance that permits you to cite and receive revenue for parking that's not on MRCA property? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, we're afraid that we're, I'll take a note on that. So you just, for next time, correct? Yeah. Okay. I think or, 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 or a time after that, just at some point in the future. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank very you. good. Yeah. How it goes is we, we cite on our parks anything adjacent to and related to our parks. Thank you, Tim. I have a couple. Just a follow up to that one, and then also, if there's a um, a division of the uh, monies that are collected on that, how is it allocated? It, you know, does it just go to MRCA, or is it um, also allocated to the county or the city or anything else like that? It, it goes through our administration process. And it's allocated, uh, I believe, so just to the MRCA. Okay. So yeah. if we could just clarify that. I would like that information also. Okay. And then also, how many rangers did you have on duty during this last time period? Well, per day, three. Okay. And then on the busy weekends, we also have public officers as well as another extra ranger, so about four plus another two public officers. And what do the public officers do differently than They the mostly rangers? do uh, uh, parking citations and crowd control, and they do trail patrols, foot patrol, looking for smokers, violators, you know, are drinking and smoking and so okay. forth. And then who picks up trash? Our, uh, we all do. Okay. <laughs> we do everything, facets of public safety, but our maintenance crew. We have a maintenance crew every every day that will hit, like, Lechuza Beach twice twice a day, you know, to keep the trash cans and uh, liners clean and, and so forth. Okay. Thank so you. it's every day. Thank you, Ranger. Thank you, Tim. By the way, Tim, I, I appreciate that you're issuing parking citations. I don't mean to suggest otherwise. Just if, if we're entitled to some portion of the revenue, I'd like to understand that. Sure, yeah. Thank you. Right, sure. You're welcome. Happy holidays. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Norm, you're up. Followed by Graham, followed by Joe. Good evening, uh, council members. Approximately four weeks ago, I brought up an issue regarding the uh, four-year moratorium on people filing primary view determinations 
across property that um, was burned to the ground. Um, the four-year moratorium, the intent was to give the fire rebuilds a chance to build a house uh, before someone filed a primary uh, view determination across the property because now they have an ocean view. Well, of course they have an ocean view. <clears throat> there's no house and there's no mature vegetation. And what we found is that four years was not long enough. Uh, by the time a person uh, gets his insurance settlement uh, and deals with the two and a half years of the COVID pandemic, um, he's very close to filing an application, but he's very close to also ending not not being able to file it before the four-year moratorium is up. <clears throat> Several people that I know actually filed an application before the four-year moratorium was up, but by the time the staff was able to process the application, somebody came in and filed a primary view uh, determination across the property. <clears throat> and it's just inconsistent with the intent. Now, tonight, you're going to approve, I think, uh, three additional years of benefits to fire rebuilds. And I'm looking, I'm looking primarily what I'm here for is to get a date when this can be in front of the city council. Four weeks ago, the council, four of the council members voted to put this on an agenda for the city council. And that's what I'm here to ask. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer any of them. Thank you, Norm. Thank you. Graham, followed by Joe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council members, Trevor, Steve, staff. Um, now I know more about ADUs than I ever wanted to know. Um, but I'm here because last Sunday, not yesterday, but the last Sunday, I was held up for an hour, Pacific Coast Highway, heading north because of another high-speed, high expensive sports car wrecked in the middle of the Civic Center. And, um, you know, I think that I've been listening to everything that's been said about this, and I think signs are fine, the speed limits, I mean, speed, reducing the speed limit's fine, although I think the speed limit on the Pacific Coast Highway is fine the way it is if people would drive at the speed limit. The problem we have is enforcement and consequences. Um, to have proper enforcement, we need a million policemen on the road. In England, you, you don't have any. You never see one because there are cameras everywhere. We need cameras up and down Pacific Coast Highway. They do the job for the patrol people, and they do it more efficiently, and there's no argument. There's your license plate. When you're in England, if you speed and people don't, the speed limit in the city is 25 miles an hour, and everybody sticks to it. Because if you don't, by the time you get home, there's a, there's a speeding ticket in your mailbox. And not only is it there, right then, it's, it's a serious fine. It's not 200 bucks, it's a big one. And it affects your insurance, and if you don't pay it, watch out. And, and so, you know, we have the people who are killing people on our roads, uh, like, like Emily and the four girls, at Pepperdine girls, they don't care about speed limits. They don't care about signs. They don't even look at the signs. Um, it, you, the only thing that reaches these people is a consequence. You've got to give them a big fat fine and, and, and take their license away. That's, that's what we need to be aiming towards. I don't know how we get to that place. And, uh, you know, we have another uncontrollable issue, which is the proliferation of hugely powerful cars. Here's a new one that just came on the market. I'm a car guy. Here's a new one, 760 horsepower, 211 miles an hour. Now, where are you going to use that on any road in this nation? It's ridiculous. And yet, and most of the drivers who are, who are killing people are, not surprisingly, relatively young, inexperienced, therefore inexperienced drivers, and irresponsible. 
like I was when I was that age. So, I mean, we have to get cameras on the highway. I think that's the, that's the main thing. And, um, and, you know, I never thought I'd say this, but you know, maybe self-driving cars are a good thing. <laughs> so anyway, cameras, guys, cameras, enforcement, punishment. Thank, thank you, Graham. We're with you. We don't want the wussification of America to continue. Joe, you're out. Colin's gone, so you got three minutes, Joe. Yeah. Um, so, oh, and with regards to ADUs and CEQA, there was no cumulative act, um, analysis, so I think that's a hollow assertion <laughs> with the ADUs. Anyway, um, I'd also like to ask the MRCA Ranger if you could clear the fire hazardous and view blocking brush at Big Rock and PCH at the Vista Point. There, it's um, it's it's supposed to be a view corridor, and and it's your property. So be a good neighbor and clear that. That would be great. Big Rock and Vista. P PCH. PCH. Yeah. Thank you. And if Caltrans won't rush out to, I think I had a little discussion with Rob Dubo today about the PCH and the safety in the open parts of the roads. If they, if they, I think he said that, I mean, you, he'll talk about this after, but that medians can go in certain areas where it can make it not appear as open and where you want to speed. So you can, if you guys have this emergency ordinance and if Caltrans won't do it, you guys can actually do this, like put these temporary medians until they do it, I would hope. And um, especially in Western Malibu as well, not just Eastern Malibu, but especially that dead man's curve. So Rob can explain how it will make PCH safer and I'm sure the council would vote to make this happen. Um, also with regards to the farmer's market, Georgia For Goldfarb checked with some of the vendors of it and apparently the chili cook-off site would work well for them. They'd put their tent on the other side of the sidewalk and park on the street on the other side of that sidewalk. Thus they'd have good access to their products and their cars protect them from customers or any errant drivers. And she thinks that this is the easiest, safest, and lowest cost alternative if Legacy Park can't be used. Of course, if we can negotiate with Parencio and get Legacy Park, that seems to be preferred by most residents. And if we could clean up the homeless there, that would be good too. Um, there aren't, these aren't required. The, I mean, if we have shrubs or trees that could be put on the chili cook-off lot, lot, that would be good as well, but not required. Um, and it involves moving a fence back apparently, 20 feet minimum, but it could be nicer if it were covered with grass, native of course, and had a few tables, it could be used throughout the week. Obviously, um, also, Rob and I had a discussion today about if we wanted to close off a portion of Civic Center Way, that could also be possible. Whole Foods might be objecting, but it's just, there are other alternatives that can be done. So, thanks. Thank you, Joe. Pamela, you're up next. Is there a Stephanie? Stephanie, Stephanie Sunwoo? You can come Did up you? this way. You can come up, yeah, just grab a seat in front. Oh. Oh, go ahead, Pamela. Good evening, Pamela conley Ulick. Uh, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, uh, happy almost 2024. I served eight years on that Malibu City Council and it's not easy. And I'm here to talk, I mean, it's now, what time is it? Let's see, it's 8.58 at night, it's almost 9 p.m. And you're you, we, we finally have public comments. So thank you for getting to it before 10 p.m. I'm here to talk about mental health and wellness, and I think there's a real crisis happening in our town, in our country, in our world. And I would like to just bring up this point and to thank the neighbors who are helping each other. We saw Dick Van Dyke earlier. He always helped with the library. We, we saw Jeff Jennings. I remember when I served with him on city council, he'd always say, be brief, be brilliant, be gone. So I'm gonna try and stick to that motto. But I also want to thank a lot of neighbors who are here tonight. I will be testifying on item 6A, uh, I believe, but I would like to thank some neighbors who have helped with the Mar Malibu Marathon tonight. I would like to call out Cassidy, if you're here. 
She's out, but I want to really want to thank her and what she's done with those kids for their mental health and wellness and prepping them and training for the marathon. I think it can go a long way. I think we need to get those facilities built for our youth and, and seniors in this town. So what Marianne said, I agree with you. Like the ADU, thank God you got it done, but come on. We've got other issues that are affecting all of us now, and let's get on it. Um, I'd also like to thank Veronica and Brennan here tonight. They helped with the Malibu Triathlon. They've helped with Children's Hospital. They did an amazing job. They got a local I testified before who was afraid of the water. She got out there and swam for the first time since she witnessed a drowning. And that's overcoming mental health and, and becoming well and supporting our community. So I will be calling in to later, I don't know, hopefully it's not after 12 because I don't know if I can stay up. But I want to really ask you tonight to look at the people out there who are helping and reward them and help them. Help these programs, help the race, the triathlon, help the, the marathon, the half marathon. Give us opportunities so we can get healthier. And I want to challenge every single one of you, Steve, the mayor, Doug, Bruce, Marianne, and Paul, you're coming up on 2024 and your New Year's resolution. I want you to take your own health and be a role model for all of us to treat each other with respect. I've, I'm seeing that to get out for our community with us and run, walk, whatever you can do, but be a role model for mental health and wellness because we all need that. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Stephanie, you're up. Good evening, Mayor Uring and City Council members. My name is Stephanie Sunwu. I'm a 24-year Malibu resident, and I'm here representing a group of well over 200 Malibu citizens who want the most robust wireless safety protocol. I love Malibu, the beauty of the place and its people. That's why I've spoken at and attended many City Council and Planning Commission meetings over the past two years to ensure we have the strongest fire safety protocol. And because I love Malibu, it just breaks my heart to witness the current state of the wireless situation. Why do we have to keep coming back to complain about wireless shenanigans? We come to you, we came to you on June 26th, almost six months ago, and asked you to take charge by imposing transparency in the wireless permitting process, and separately to get moving on updating the current wireless ordinances. You all agreed to start the update, and you encouraged us to try and work out the transparency issue with staff. We tried, but staff shut us down and kept us in the dark. The ordinance update was never put on the agenda, and things have only gotten worse. We have discovered that we were all deceived about how the permitting process is working or actually not working. No one is enforcing the rules. The wireless companies are in control. The planning and environmental sustainability department heads are recklessly issuing permits for demonstrably dangerous cell sites and trying to hide the truth from the public we will all suffer the consequences. I'm here to tell you once again, there are shenanigans going on behind the scenes. People's lives and property are being put to needless risk. We respectfully ask city council to demand answers, force transparency, do something to fix these problems. And please, would you please this time get the wireless ordinance update placed on an agenda soon after the holidays? And if needed, you can always reach out to our attorney, Scott McCullough. Thank you. Stephanie, thank you very much. It's the last speaker slip. What are you, any hands? There are three raised hands. First is Lonnie Gordon. Lonnie, you're on. Hold on one second. Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Good evening. My name is Lonnie Gordon, and I'm the executive director of Malibu for SafeTech.org, and I'm representing a great number of Malibu residents tonight. 
<clears throat> excuse me. What secrets are the planning and environmental sustainability department trying to keep from the council and the public? There's a big problem that they created and they do not want exposed. The council approved the fire safety protocol to help Malibu protect from another telecom initiated fire. Wireless facility permit applicants are required to submit eight engineering documents that collectively demonstrate safe electrical design. The applicant is required to submit proof that the facility complies with national site hardening standards. But it's now clear that neither ESC or planning have enforced these submission requirements. The carriers are getting permits without having to prove the facility design. Whoops. Sorry, it's electrically sound and also structurally sufficient, uh, sufficient to withstand the kind of wind and seismic events that prevail in Malibu. The residence expert has identified multiple design defects that are evident. Hey, on the Lonnie, can you, you're going to have to speak a little louder or closer to the microphone because um, you're, you're fading I'm, over. I'm sorry, when I, I said, oops, my one of the earplugs came out and it was one with the speaker. So can, if, give me my time back, please. The carriers are getting permits without have thank you Steve, without having to prove the facility design is electrically sound and also structurally sufficient to withstand the kind of wind and seismic events that are that prevail in Malibu. The the residence expert has expert has identified multiple design defects that are evident on the face of many plans, even without the eight required fire the fire safety protocol documents. These problems exist for still pending permit cases, but it looks like the same problems apply to facilities that are already permitted and in operation throughout the city. ESC has completely failed to enforce the rules and worse has been negligent and derelict in its duty to ensure projects that are safe because before they're allowed to go into operation. We want answers yet no one's talking to the residents about what's happened. Our public records requests are being stonewalled. ESD is simply refusing to produce any documents. And this is unacceptable and something has to be done. We propose a simple solution. We use the wireless consultant you've already hired, BMS, for application completeness review and building plan check instead of ESD. EMS can review the plans and conduct a final inspection to ensure electrical and structural compliance and safety. The wireless companies pay CMS costs, so taking this route will actually save the city time and money. Then you need to find out what's going on behind the closed doors and why the two department heads let this happen and how it can be prevented going forward. These steps are essential if the city council wants to truly minimize the risk of Malibu suffering yet another devastating telecom caused wildfire. Please take action. Thank you, Lonnie. Thanks. Who's next? Jamie Francis. Jamie? Thank you, thank you, city council. I wanted to just mention, um, because everything was referring to the ADUs before, about the housing element, which isn't on the agenda, but it's very important because back in July of 2021, I was given these postcards from the planning, uh, planning department, which I do appreciate. However, they only refer to the city council when they're going to go for a vote before, you know, the, you know, or if they're going to jockey it back to the planning commission, which I don't get such notices. So I just want to say that it's important because I missed these vital votes and luckily you tabled it or brought it back. Otherwise I wouldn't have had a chance to speak on this. And it's really troublesome when I hear council members and I'm not saying this facetiously, but I don't want to hear when a council member suggests having a maid live in a unit or have a son that's an actor, out of work actor, that is housing discrimination. And furthermore, I just want to say that there are state laws and county laws in place that you have to qualify for affordable housing, which, you know, Councilmember Crescenti is actually right in saying that. So with his colleagues referring to that, you can't do that because then it's like a living indentured servitude. You, you have to be aware of the laws. The county states that you have to have income criteria that allows you to have accessible low income housing in every community in this city. And you can't just use an excuse or have other public speakers saying, well, do they live in the neighborhood already? 
Are they our neighbors? Are they a family of neighbors? That is housing discrimination. That's against the UNRU Act that was passed in 1968, the Fair Housing Act. You can't be saying things like that. That is, it's implausible. If you're trying to look at, you know, creating affordable housing, you failed. And now people have to call out the city. But you cannot have council members say, how about a son? How about a daughter? Well, that's basically, it's like you're living in a trust of a house and you're saying that you qualify for an ADU, that, that is besides the point of what we're trying to address. And that makes no sense. That's unplausible. So please be aware of that. You cannot be violating the Housing Rights Act of 1968 that California implemented that apparently Malibu is not you know, going in accordance to. But you're actually, since 1991, for, you know, 30, what, 32 years? I mean, it's ridiculous. You have to be aware of this, that when you pass a housing element, you have to be in accordance with state law. But to your luck is that they didn't have anything in the ordinance or state governance that, that implemented this or mandated this, and now they do. So you got away with this for 30 years, and now there is no more excuse. And please don't, as council members, say, how about a maid? How about our, our, you know, our handyman? How about our out of some actor of a worker or whoever? It's like, got a college. Thank you, Jamie. That makes them ineligible. Thank you, Jamie. Anybody else? Ryan. Ryan, you're on. Yes, I'm, I'm here. I spoke to you previously about having the staff grants writer for the city apply to the state. Uh, or the federal government for uh, special traffic enforcement safety grants. Office of Traffic Safety in particular, the state of California has uh, tax funds available for special enforcement of impaired driving. It's a marijuana tax, but you can use it for any type of uh, enforcement uh, patrol on the highway and they can pull over flagrant feeders for that. I want to say in particular, uh, development of speed limits on state highways falls under some different criteria, and particularly a vehicle code section 22354.5. And then lastly, I wanted to say, under the California Traffic Manual for Speed Zone Approval and Distribution, it has Chapter 6, which um, says that the speed zoning must be in consultation with the local California Highway Patrol and other agencies, includes the city of Malibu in our instance. So we need to um, assert this uh, requirement that the discussions and local insight regarding non-apparent conditions, collision data, and level of opposition to change in addition, discussions to help in locating the beginning and ending of special, you know, areas for these individual speed zones. But section 6.2.2, this chapter 6, requires that the local government be notified and uh, the right to have a public hearing. So I would like to have someone um, assigned at the city with the task of checking into these requirements and making sure that the city is not shortchanged in any of these functions. Lastly, I know we're paying currently out of pocket for the highway patrol to come back and augment for traffic law enforcement. But ultimately, this is really a burden of the state. That's a legislative change that needs to occur. I hope that's still a, a top priority of your legislative agenda and working in concert with our other state officials to achieve that. Um, it's an extremely important issue because we will not be able to fund what the Highway Patrol used to do in Malibu with uh, 25 employees when they left. So thank you very much for this chance to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Anybody any other hands? No, those are all the raised hands. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, first thing, I think probably first on our mind for most folks is what uh, is happening with um, the safety issues with Pacific Coast Highway. Um, so first thing I want to announce is that there is going to be a follow-up uh, PCH task force meeting. It's going to be a virtual meeting. It's going to be this Wednesday, 
December 13th at 10 a.m. Uh, we expect to hear an update from Caltrans, and the city will also be giving an update on our actions. Uh, I know our public works director has had uh, several meetings with the Caltrans staff. Uh, they've been out several times just to take a look at the, uh, at the road and the issues out there. And I know that they're working through a, a series of recommendations and working on bringing back a, a plan. Uh, so we're looking to see an update uh, from Caltrans at the, on the 13th on that. Also wanted to note uh, that the uh, city staff has created an information page on Pacific Coast Highway Safety, and I think in a moment they might be able to bring that up for me. Uh, we're, this is going to be up on the city's website. It was live on Friday, and uh, we're, we will be putting information up on that page every time that we have anything new related to PCH safety, uh, anything new from Caltrans, or anything new related to enforcement. We'll also be posting any information that we have related to enforcement, any special activities, uh, any, anything new related to PCH. So that's going to be our, our uh, landing page for, for all things related to PCH safety. Uh, we are still working on the, uh, the details for the long-term contract with the CHP. Um, we were hoping to have that ready for you this evening uh, to have that approved, but we are still working through some issues with that. I'm still optimistic that we can bring a contract forward to get the task force going, uh, I'll, and um, I'll keep you apprised as we continue to move forward on that. I, um, so as again, just, just need to work out some details with the CHP office, and I think we can get that resolved fairly soon. Also, um, I think people are aware that we uh, last week broke ground and officially moving forward on the traffic signal synchronization project on PCH. Um, so that will, of course, help link all the signals together. I know our public works director is looking at, is adding some other safety enhancements as part of that project uh, to trigger red lights when we detect speeders. Uh, so uh, very eager to see that project get going. Uh, also, I know that the, the council has mentioned, I know also heard from one of the public speakers tonight about speed cameras. Um, and I think you're aware that um, our assembly member and our state senator I uh, have agreed to introduce uh, co-sponsored legislation uh, in the coming year to see if they can expand this pilot program uh, for speed cameras to include Malibu, to include uh, PCH through Malibu. Uh, we heard an update from our California strategies today on that, uh, and they are working very closely uh, with the staff in the, in the assembly member and senator's office on that. Um, so that is moving forward as well. Um, also wanted to note that um, um, Caltrans has made some adjustments uh, around Corral Canyon. Uh, they are doing some work there to um, basically turn that culvert into a bridge. Uh, and uh, our public works director made contact with them today. There are some, some concerns with how that is being laid out and striped out. Uh, and we communicated those concerns to Caltrans. Um, we expect to, to hear back from them soon on some modifications on the uh, Corral Canyon. But I guess the good news is that the speed limits got lowered down there, at least through the uh, construction portion of this project. Uh, moving on, uh, I think we uh, perhaps dodged a bullet this last weekend with our red flag warnings. Uh, we did have uh, a series of warnings uh, and, and threats of potential public safety power shutoffs uh, leading up and into this past weekend. Uh, but fortunately, no shutoffs were imposed here in the city. Uh, as a reminder, we do have representatives from SCE scheduled for the January 8th City Council meeting to give the council and community an update. And then also on January 8th, we will be coming back to City Council with options uh, for the location of the farmer's market. We're working on that. And uh, let's see, for those who didn't hear the bad news about the state budget, um, they're looking at uh, an over $60 billion budget deficit. Uh, unknown at this time how that might impact cities going forward. Uh, the good news is the state does have a rainy day fund of about $30 billion that can apply, uh, but obviously that still leaves a rather significant shortfall to address. Uh, so we'll keep you posted as that moves forward. Uh, also wanted to note that on January 8th, we expect to bring forward an award of contract for the outreach for the vacant land. Uh, we are currently uh, interviewing applicants and we expect to have a recommendation to council, as I said, on January 8th. Also, uh, wanted to note that today the city did receive an appeal for or the uh, decision 
uh, by the Planning Commission to approve the skate park last week. Um, so that, that was filed today. Uh, that will come to City Council to hear that appeal at a date to be determined. Also just wanted to remind everybody that uh, City Hall will be uh, closed for our winter closure uh, December 22nd through January 1st. Um, there will be limited city services available during that time to ensure that urgent matters can be addressed. Um, we are providing limited services for code enforcement and inspection, so those are continuing during the break. There will be a reduction in staffing levels, and that may, be, uh, may affect on how fast we can get that out there, but they will be working. Uh, code enforcement will be here, and they will also be uh, checking uh, the, uh, the phone line for complaints as well. Also, um, because of that closure, the last day for persons to submit any uh, applications for special event permits or temporary use permits uh, in calendar year 2023, that deadline will be December 21st. And of course, all of our emergency services, LA County Fire, Sheriff's Department, they will be operating as normally. Our public safety staff will also be monitoring and providing alerts as well. And with that, we just wish everybody a joyful and safe holiday season, and we uh, thank you for your continued support, and we look forward to continuing to serve you in the coming year. Steve, thank you. Bruce? Yeah, Steve, I have a question for yep. you. I, the um, Corral Canyon, um, the change in the road there, um, I've noticed that the turn lane going left into Corral Canyon from PCH has been eliminated, and it says no U-turn, but it doesn't say no left turn. Is it, are people allowed to turn left right out of, stop on PCH and turn left? And what's going on with that? I'm going to ask our public yeah, works director to address that. He was out there he was today. Out there today yeah. He could give you an answer to that. And, and that was my same question to the Caltrans. And, uh, yeah, we went out there and looked at it. We had uh, the sheriff's department. We had commissioners from public safety. And we noticed the same thing, that... Um, there isn't any restrictions on left turns, and so somebody can get rear-ended over there. So Caltrans is evaluating and seeing what things can be done to fix that area over there. There is some solutions to, to do some of that work. We're, we're, they have to figure it out. They're going to have to make sure the engineering works to kind of to kind of do that. They, they, you know, they, they, I'm going to be talking about this later, but they can't, they can't study this and wait. We, someone's going to get killed tomorrow I, if they don't fix this. Correct. Yeah, that, and that was brought to their attention. Okay, and I'll just note the, um, it's, it's also lowered to 30 miles per hour in both directions on the sides of that. I slow down to 30, I feel like someone's gonna hit me because no one else is slowing down to 30. It's just people are still going 50 miles an hour. So it's, it's a situation where it's more dangerous to slow down and do the speed limit than it is to just, just go the speed. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Sure. Thank you, Rob. I think I have I a appreciate question. Appreciate your effort. Yes, go ahead. Mary. So um, I also saw that their crosswalk was. Um, <laughs> could you give? Is that a permanent or is that just a temporary? Given everything happening at the intersection. Yeah. So so my expression there when I came up this morning was, "What is this crosswalk that's doing out there?" Uh, um, yeah, they're going to look at that too. They they also saw that was a safety issue with the location of that temporary side or a crosswalk and we're um they're they're looking into different options of where they can relocate that or do something differently yeah at least it also gets some lights or something to notify when people are crossing anybody else me oh rob I'm, i know that you've driven through trancus and over to trancus creek at some time during the last two years and you've noticed that that is very much screwed up as well. And for those of you who are upset about the amount you slow down and feel dangerous, I just hit the emergency flashers when I'm going through that at, at this posted speed limit because that's what it's gonna be. And they're gonna screw up corral just like they, the other one. And that's what it takes to build a new bridge in, on the highway while still letting traffic through. You take down part of the road, build a new bridge, then you take down the next part of the road, build a new bridge in that portion and, and work your way across. And it's, there's, there's no quick way to do this, I don't think. Or at least they haven't figured out one. Anybody else? No, okay, Rob, thank you very much. Appreciate your effort, Sergeant. Bring him up.
Good evening, sir. Good evening, City Council. How are we all doing tonight? So I have the uh, latest crime statistics for November. Um, <clears throat> there were 35 Part 1 crimes in November, uh, which again, the Part 1 crimes are the most serious crimes. Um, by far, the number one crime was uh, burglary from locked vehicles at 12. And then the next two were tied, uh, uh, grand theft and petty theft with five each. So that brings us year to date, 425 part one crimes compared to 461 uh, the same time last year. So that's a 7.8% decrease year over year. So we are still below the trend line, which is good to see. There were um, <clears throat> a couple noteworthy incidents. Um, in one incident here, which happened on December 1st, uh, this month actually, uh, deputies responded at about eight o'clock in the evening to the uh, 30,000 block of Morning View Drive. And the call was regarding a male who was screaming and making threats to the residents in the neighborhood. When the deputies arrived, they located him and determined that he was drunk and unable to care for himself. And he was arrested for being drunk in public. And while they were transporting him back to the station, he became uncooperative and yelling again and spit on the deputy through the partition in the uh, back seat of the car. So he was arrested for battery on a peace officer as well as being drunk in public. Um, in another incident, a uh, New York resident was arrested uh, in the 3800 block of Cross Creek Road, so right down the street here, while attempting to cash a fictitious check with a counterfeit ID and passport. And then in another incident, uh, this one was on November 3rd at Sephora down the street here on Cross Creek. They were a victim of an organized retail theft ring. And in that incident, um, let's see here, uh, employees noticed uh, two females inside the store wearing what they believe to be booster skirts. And so booster skirts, what they are is they're a skirt that conceals large pockets that suspects used to conceal large amounts of stolen property. So they noticed these, uh, these female adults inside the store and notified their loss prevention, who reviewed the cameras because by the time loss prevention was notified, the suspects were gone. And so they reviewed the cameras and sure enough, uh, they were using booster skirts to conceal over $3,600 worth of of uh, items from the store. And they were able to, in eight minutes, steal 30, over $3,600 worth of products. So um, they have been identified by our detective uh, bureau and they're part of a Romanian theft group. So we have uh, a warrant out for their arrest at this time. So. Um, Today, actually, there was a mountain lion sighting a couple hours ago. I have the information here for the residents. Uh, so in the rear of Malibu Seafood, uh, in the parking lot, there was a mountain lion sighting near the dumpster. And then when the deputies arrived, uh, they ran off into the hills. So please be aware that they're out there. Um, we talked about it earlier just now, but uh, we did a ride along with Caltrans. We piled into our... Uh, 15 passenger prisoner van and I chauffeured them up and down PCH and so Corral Canyon yes was one of the uh, hot topics that we stopped at and um, their words was well it's not in the plan so we need to look at it so what you would think would be common sense to fix well it's not in the plan so we need to look at it so uh, on Wednesday I please hold their feet to the fire and make changes because it was a very unsafe situation at that intersection. And we saw it firsthand of people stopping in the middle of the road and people having to swerve out of the way not to hit them. Uh, the other area we stopped at was Trancus Canyon uh, with the S curves through there with the K rails. Um, they're going to put some additional signage to show which way the road is going. And so we were able to show them that. So it, it seemed like a productive uh, trip today. I hope. Um, and finally, um, the 
crash that happened at uh, PCH and Webway, uh, I have that information, December 3rd. So a driver in a Dodge Viper was driving at a high rate of speed and lost control and hit a parked vehicle on the uh, northbound side of the roadway. So they're going westbound. And after they hit that parked car, they hit one of our community service officers in Mark Sheriff vehicle, who was also parked on the side of the road. And our community service officer, she suffered a lower back pain and some injuries, some abrasions as in, she's still out of work. So um, we're lucky nobody got killed in that accident because it was a very high speed crash. And yet again, we see speed is another factor. How old and another high speed. How yeah. old was that person, do you know? The driver, let's see. Born in 1970, so oh, 53 years old. <laughs> so. Did you impound the car? Uh, for 30 it was days? totaled. It was so, totaled? Yes. Oh. Did you go to his house and impound some other car? <laughs> I wish we could, but. <laughs> Okay, super. And that's all I have. I'm available for questions. Questions. Go ahead, Bruce. Two questions. Uh, two questions. First of all, the um, drunken disorderly morning view, was was that someone from outside of Malibu or in Malibu? That was... They have a Malibu address. Okay. Um, and there, I, I've been getting a lot of comments from residents about a home invasion that occurred or and I think it was in the paper in um, West Malibu. I don't recall hearing about that during a city council meeting, although maybe you talked about it and I just don't recall it. Was Is that something that we've been told about? I believe I talked about it last time. Okay. Um, My bad if I missed it. Yeah. Thank you. Mary Ann? Oh, Doug. Um, Sergeant, um, first off, the community service oh. officer, before I start, it wasn't a home invasion. It was just a residential burglary. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sergeant, uh, was that a VOP car that was injured, uh, damaged, or was, did you say community service officer? A community service officer. Okay, so it was one of the full-time employees. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm glad she's doing all right. Uh, would have been. I can't imagine it being any worse, but uh, maybe if it was a VOP, it would be very bad to be a volunteer and get hurt like that. Um, you haven't mentioned lately anything about the speeders being caught. Uh, they're doing excessive speed. Have we seen a reduction in that, or are we not as patrolling as hard? Because we there for a while we were picking up about one a week or two a week. So um, I've hired uh, two motors since we last talked to do the uh, traffic enforcement, the saturation, and they've issued another 32 citations on top of what we've already done. Um, I was planning to do another operation again. Um, however, one of our motors was injured, and he's out um, right now. Not not permanently, but he'll be back soon. And when he's back, then we're going to schedule another one. By the way, anecdotally, uh, I think we're all hearing that there's less uh, speeding and uh, not as many cars racing back and forth. So uh, what we're doing seems to be working. Uh, be glad when you can get more people on the, on the road, and we can have the highway patrol out with you more often, too. All right. Thank you. Here in. Do we know, I, I know this isn't really your expertise, but uh, the mountain lion, do we know if it was collared? I don't have that information. Okay. Do we think it's the same one that was in Solstice Canyon? Maybe? It's in proximity to <laughs> yeah. it, so I would say maybe. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else, Paul? No? Thank Sorry, you. Thank you very, very much. Again, you You're guys welcome. are doing a great job. You know, it's interesting. Over the course of the last weekend, I attended four different events. And every one of the event, one of the residents came up to me and said, you know, I saw this cop catch this guy speeding, pulled him over. So the people are beginning to recognize the work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, back to the console table. Anybody want to start? Bruce? Sure, I'm happy to start this time. I just want to talk about one thing and one thing only, which is PCH safety, to follow up on that last comment. 
Um, and I'm going to ask again, as I have before, that we get a consensus to bring back at least an item for discussion of unilateral actions we can take pursuant to our declaration of um, local emergency that may further facilitate a safety on PCH. Um, last two weeks ago, I proposed that Doug wouldn't support bringing back an item unless I could explain how it could be um, enforced. Uh, Paul opposed it because apparently we're all having great success in training the 5 million people who visit the city how to drive safely. And Marianne opposed it because uh, we have a list of items on a, that are five years old and we're, we're working on getting that list done. Um, I doubt I can persuade Paul and Marianne, but I'm hoping that Doug will change his mind because here's my pitch about why it doesn't matter whether law enforcement is willing to enforce our unilateral actions. Um, as I see it, each of the following traffic calming measures has potential to slow traffic on PCH without regard to enforcement, and I'm hoping we can at least have a discussion of them at an agendized item so that maybe we can implement some. Um, electronic signs, warning of various matters such as danger ahead, proceed with caution, safety corridor, reduce speed. We could even add, even though it's not true, fines tripled for speeding. We could have signs that say slow down, speed checked by radar. We could install flashing red or yellow lights. It doesn't matter if they won't be enforced. They will still have the effect of slowing people down. They may not slow everybody down, but they'll slow some people down. And with some people slowed down, other people will have to slow down. We could have collapsible, could, I have, could we put up the, um, the, the pictures I took, I mean, I got from Google Maps actually. Um, there's, there's multiple places already in town where there are these lane, divide, lane separators. They're collapsible, um, no one's gonna get hurt by hitting one, but they narrow or at least give the appearance of a narrower um, lane. There, there's a couple of them. One is in, at Corral, it was there before, it's there now. Um, one in front of Dukes, one on Malibu Canyon. Um, these are all only where there is a left turn lane, but there's no reason why they have to be limited to left turn lane areas. They can be placed various places along PCH. They can be placed um, even perhaps in the center white lane at different places. Again, giving people the appearance of less space will cause them to slow down their speed. We could use K-rails. Um, we could close lanes from time to time and from place to place. Again, these are all things we could do unilaterally. I know that Caltrans will say we don't have the authority to do them, but I say under our emergency ordinance, we do, and let them sue us and let the Los Angeles Times have to um, cover the fact that Caltrans is trying to prevent Malibu from saving lives. Um, we could put up, we could, we could get more decoy law enforcement vehicles. I've noticed there are a few of them out there and they are effective, I believe. We could investigate, as I said before, self-driving cars to calm the traffic. Just put them out there, have them drive at the speed limit or maybe even five miles below. We could close middle turn lanes from, at different places. We could close parking spaces with barriers. We could, um, and I'm sure that you all, intelligent council members, have other ideas that I'm not thinking of and I'm sure the public will have ideas that I'm not thinking of if we put this on the agenda and we have a serious discussion of what we can do unilaterally to make PCH safer. So again, I'm gonna ask if we have a consensus to bring this back for a discussion of what we can do to give some teeth to our emergency declaration. I'm hoping that the landing page for the city on PCH safety will say, city council to consider further actions to improve safety on PCH. Can we get a consensus this time? Bruce, in two days, Caltrans is gonna be here talking about their list of things that they can do for us. Now they may come and say they can't do anything and forget it, we don't like Malibu, we're never gonna come here again. Or they may actually have something useful that they can actually do or authorize for us to do. I think it would be a good idea to have that happen before we charge off and do some stuff that will look good, but pile liability on the city. Well, the good news, Paul, is that the next city council meeting will be after Wednesday. So if they come back with a whole bunch of stuff that satisfies us, we can applaud that and not ask for anything else to be done two weeks later. But if they, again, tell us they need to study things and that, yes, we see the issues and we're looking into them, we can have our meeting two, a week and a half later because they'll, that meeting will have come and gone. I would say in addition to Caltrans, it's also going to be 
uh, Senator Van Allen and Assemblymember Jackie Irwin and Council, uh, County Supervisor Lindsay Horvath, who have all expressed um, great interest in making changes and creating legislation so that we do have the legal teeth with, for our enforcement. So I think um, hearing from them on Wednesday, and then we can talk about this on a future meeting if uh, there's things there that aren't um, within what our community is looking to have done. Okay, well, again, the request is that we have this on our agenda for a meeting that follows that meeting. And um, I guarantee no legislation is being adopted in the next month, two months, six months, or possibly even a year. No. Okay, um, Bruce, you, you make it sound like we're anti-safety, and that's not true at all. Uh, I think the, the thing to look at, and I just think about this, when you watch a football game, especially on television, there's usually one time during the game where the, one of the announcers goes, he just uh, dropped an easy pass. He could have he got that. And the other announcer goes, he took his eyes off the ball and he was looking about where he was going to go next. And that's kind of where I think we are right now. And I, I'm going to agree with you that we want to bring this back. But let's, let's keep something in perspective. If you look at that, and I haven't seen the PCS, PCH uh, safety page, but if you look at all the things that we have in process, the, we spent, uh, well, when we had the PCH task force before, the city said, these are what we want, more enforcement, safe uh, streets corridor, speed cameras, Caltrans to be active on uh, the 200, uh, 2015 items. We also had some other things that we had on the agenda. So we've got things in process that if we take our eyes off the ball, we're not going to be tracking those as much. So my suggestion is, and those of you who heard me use this phrase before, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Well, we need to be keeping an eye on what we've requested to be done and make sure it gets it happens. Those speed cameras, for example, on January the 1st, the legislature open up, opens up again. And let's make sure that legislation is being tracked and followed, and that's just one example of it. So let me suggest this. We have two things we need to do, and you left off one very important item. The emergency ordinance that we have expires, I believe, January 13th. We need to make sure that's on the agenda for January the 8th to be extended at least another 60 days. Now, granted, we're looking at that emergency ordinance and saying it doesn't seem to have much effect because we don't have anybody to apply it to except the city itself. But it's good to have it. Now, the other thing I would suggest is maybe the meeting after that, let's have a thorough review of what our items in process are. Going back to the business example that we've used up here several times, we would have a review. And by the way, one of the packages tonight has a review in it about uh, tracking things that we have underway. We do the same thing for this uh, safety. Let's see what we got underway, see what needs to be adjusted. That's part of the process. Make sure we've got the things that are in process. We're tracking them and we fix those before we start adding anything else new, new to it. So the examples that you just put on the screen are very nice, but that's not our highway. And I appreciate the idea of trying to make a grandstand play with the LA Times, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to offend uh, the legislature or other people about seeing that, seeming that we're not being cooperative when we're getting things accomplished. And as several people have said, we've got a meeting this Wednesday where we're going to have a pretty, pretty wholesome review, hopefully, of what's been accomplished. So I'm in agreement. Let's bring back your, your request to do a review, but have it be the safety review of all items in process and then see what we need to fix or add, make that the second meeting in January, with the first meeting in January, get the emergency uh, ordinance extended. Well, why don't, why don't we do them at the same time? And by the way, I, I would imagine, I, I, in fact, I can't imagine we're not going to continue to approve the resolution declaring a local emergency unless and until um, real actions are taken which reduce the danger on PCH, because it's, it's the same danger today as it was when we adopted the um, resolution, it's going to be the same danger when it comes before us to amend it. Um, but it would be great if we, at least when we are considering amending it, or I'm sorry, re reviving it, we could also consider whether we should be adding to it. Could, could we at least get it done then? I'm just being considerate of the fact that uh, the first meeting in January is going to be after we've had uh, uh, a break between meetings. We're going to have a pretty full agenda. But, uh, not be able to put that in full detail, full review, I think it would be better the second meeting in the month. 
I would agree with Doug's timeline outline. Okay, you know, since I, I don't think my fellow council people have listened to what we heard tonight. Uh, how's that work going over there at uh, Corral Canyon? Al Caltrans doing a good Caltrans doing a good job there. How about over at Trank? It's doing a good job there. I don't think so. All right, it's been 55 days since the accident. What have we heard from Caltrans? They're going to do for us anything? Nothing. Guys, we're asking for a discussion. That's all we're like, we want to do. Let's see if there is something we can come up with that will make PCH safer. That's all. That's it. Uh, and, and to not do that, I mean, that's our job. So I, I think we should bring it back. Let's talk about it. We may have a – look, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. So I, I think we've learned how to manage multiple projects and we can keep track of them and still have this conversation to see if there's something we can fix. Well, it looks like we once again don't have a consensus, and I'll just bring it up again at the next meeting. As I well. disagree. We have a consensus. I think we can. I think we have the ability to have the emergency uh, ordinance on January the eighth, and on the twenty second, do the review of items in process as well as any additional items. That's a different. That's a different topic than what we. he. we that's right. That's not what I asked for a consensus yeah. for. What, so that's fine. We have a different what, consensus. What did you ask for consensus? That we don't do to have an item on the agenda at the next meeting to consider whether to affirmatively enact unilateral actions that will make PCH safer pursuant to our um, declaration of local emergency. That's okay. been the, that was a proposal I made two weeks ago. It's a proposal I'm making again tonight. It's a proposal I'll make two weeks from now if we don't have a consensus to do it next week, next well, meeting. Let's, let's add on to your uh, item that it's a review of the items in process and do it for the, not the next meeting, but the meeting after that. Happy to review our progress every meeting as to how we're doing, but we need to have a meeting to consider further actions because the actions we've taken so far are insufficient. In fact, PCH may actually be a little more dangerous in, at Coral Canyon than it was a week ago. If I want to chime in on this? I think we should do it. I think, I think that I'm a little confused. Is this attendance reports and inquiries? No. We're at 2C, aren't we? Yes. For the past two weeks, I have been t speaking to residents, and I've been looking at options for how to do these things. That's right. what I've been spending my time doing. So I'm proposing tonight, based on that, that we have a consensus to have a discussion and possible action of unilateral things we can do to improve safety on PCH. But apparently, we're not going to get there, and that's my report. Thank you. I would recommend that at our next meeting in January 8th that we continue or to reauthorize the emergency op authorization for 60 days. And on the January 22nd meeting, we have a review of things that have been done and have a discussion. If there's additional items, we should add to um, work plan. Is that I'll back that. I'll back. I'll back that. That's a different. And, well, no, I'll support that as well. It's not. It's not. It's a half a loaf, and hopefully nobody will be so killed between now and then. Consensus. All right. Next speaker. Paul, you want to go? Sure. Uh, uh, recently, uh, last Thursday, I went to the Skag Economic Forecast in downtown LA. Uh, the only good thing is that the economic forecast was relatively more sunny than I thought it was going to be. We're looking at uh, a better economy for the country as a whole and that Southern California is going to do well, uh, they think. So let's hope that turns out. Over the weekend, I went to the Big Rock uh, holiday party and also to Carl Volante's memorial memorial service which was very nice Carl built a lot of house a lot of uh, beautiful homes and he had a lot of good friends that showed up there uh, and that's about all I've got to report Mary Ann um. Pretty light load for me. Um, I would s attended school separation meetings, um, and hopefully we're going to have some news on that in the future. Um, I did have a follow-up question with regards to the wireless ordinance. 
Um, there's differences between the right-of-way ordinance and the private property ordinance. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, that is correct. And it, does that include the, the fire question or? Off the top of my head, I want to say that the checklist that is the concern of what you heard this evening is in the um, the private property, if you will, ordinance, not the right-of-way ordinance. And the request from the speakers this evening uh, does center on amending the right-of-way ordinance to match the the private property ordinance, if you will. And did we send that up to Coastal? Are we waiting for comments from them, or what's the status of that? That is correct. The And I actually spoke to Coastal Commission about that this afternoon to ask them for an update. The one-year extension that they granted themselves, uh, it ends in February. So come February, either the options are that they would have to take action, or we as a city waive our right to having them uh, process it per their timelines. So um, I'm expecting that come January, hopefully we will hear something about a February hearing and, and what their recommendation is going to be. They have made us aware that they have concerns of the ordinance, and I expect that that also means there's changes coming our way uh, that are going to be proposed by Coastal Commission staff. Okay, but we are, when we have an application um, submitted, we are sent the, we're uh, adhering to the notification requirements where the, the site's posted, et cetera. So residents know when there is an application pending? Yes, that's correct, and we have been receiving comments. Okay, great. And that's all I had for that. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, it seems like this is a season to be uh, in attendance at things for me. Business roundtable uh, was there for the opening of the uh, Malibu High School tree lot. If you haven't been there, it's got a lot of nice trees. At least they had them when I was there. Hopefully they haven't been picked over. Um, uh, did the ad hoc policy committee meeting. Uh, attended Lenny, Lindsay Horvath's open house in Calabasas. And for those of you who don't know it, our uh, new supervisor is also the newest chair of the Board of Supervisors, youngest ever. Uh, and uh, we have a real friend there with Lindsay Horvath as well as we do with uh, Assemblymember Irwin and uh, Allen. But Lindsay, uh, really, really appreciate uh, her support for the city. She's a real resource for us. Uh, First Bank uh, Toys for Tots with the Navy League was at that and the Big Rock uh, HOA and Christmas event. A uh, couple of quick comments on the speakers tonight. Uh, for Ryan, uh, the issue we have on the grant writer and traffic enforcement is not about getting the grant written, it's about having the resources that the money can uh, buy. Um, we, are, we are resource constrained, not cash constrained on law enforcement, whether it be the Highway Patrol or the Sheriff's Department. And on the wireless ordinance, uh, I'd seen this uh, comment before about the city not being responsive to uh, requests for uh, documents. I checked that out personally. and. Um, there's more to the story there. I think you're getting all, what I'm being told, you're getting all the documents that you're asking for that are available for you to see. The ones that are in process, uh, you don't get a chance to see. It's only the ones that are finished. Uh, but I could be wrong on that, and uh, I do look forward when the wireless ordinance is brought back for a conversation on that, if there's any other comments. That's all I had. Uh, back to you, Mayor. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to be, I did a lot of events. I'm not going to go back through all those. Just got a couple quick comments. I, a friend of mine stopped by my house this weekend with a very young child, and he had a book, a little, one of these little story books for kids. Uh, and it was a story of, of these neighborhood where this new kid moved in, and nobody liked the kid, so they wouldn't talk to him. And that continued until he sat underneath some harmony tree, which was in the middle of the city. And once they sat under the harmony tree, everybody got to know each other better, so they all started talking. They liked each other. Good story. Story for kids, right? Uh, you know, little kids, because you, hopefully you teach them when they're young that they got to learn how to get along with people. Well, I think we need a, another story like that for our planning commissioners. Uh, at the last meeting, again, to embarrass ourselves, 
they went out of their way to avoid promoting jo John Mazza to the chair of the Planning Commission. Matter of fact, what they did, they tried to change the rules of the of Planning Commission to make sure he didn't get that appointment. Uh, this, this is like, again, high school stuff. And I just want to remind you, you know, when Schuyler got appointed to, or got elected to the city council, uh, the first time he had a chance to become mayor, or mayor, uh, they denied him that opportunity. He stormed off the stage and they had to go find him because he's hiding someplace. And you would think with that result that he had, he would be more diligent in making sure we treated everybody fairly. So I just hope, I just hope as we get down the road, we grow up and find a harmony tree that we can all sit under uh, and get a little, learn how to live with each other a little bit better. Uh, again, I mentioned early 55 days since the accident and nothing from Caltrans. Uh, I just think, look, anything we, anything and everything we could do, and that includes sitting down and having a discussion about things that we could do on our own, uh, is, is something we should be focusing on because that is our job. So with that, uh, I'm, let's go to the consent calendar and then we'll take a break. How's that? Well, I want to just, I think Norm, uh, Norm's thing on, on the view ordinance, if we can get that back, no, you know, the, uh, at your leisure there, guys, just give us a, give him a date when he, th he thinks he can see that so he can deal with his uh, residents he's speaking to. All right, let's do the consent calendar, then we'll take a break. How's that? Great. I'd just like to add one thing on the um, view ordinance. There's been another suggestion about uh, time limit after notification. If you remember, there was an appeal to the city council, and I believe one of the architects said, it would be a good idea if when the notice goes out about a hearing on a property that you only have so many days after that notice to do your view ordinance filing as opposed to waiting to the day before it's heard an appeal at City Council. So if there's any way to bring those two items back together, I'd appreciate it. Okay, consent calendar. Are you pulling, anybody pull anything on the consent calendar? We don't have any speaker slips, but we do have a raised hand. From Ryan. Ryan, go ahead. What do you want to pull? What do you want to pull? Which item, Ryan? Okay, any the council no, members? That's, that's okay. I, um, I'll skip it, thank you. All right, and the council members want to pull anything? Can I get a motion to approve the, approve the consent count? I'll make a motion. Make, I'll second oh, it. Bruce, I'm sorry, Bruce. No, go ahead, no, I was going to move. Oh, okay. It's okay, they can beat me to it. We got a motion. Go have second. I, I seconded. Kelsey, roll call, please. Councilmember Riggins. Yes. Councilmember Grisanti. Yes. Councilmember Silverstein. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Yes. Mayor Uring. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break, guys. So uh, 9 10, let's be back. 10 10, I mean. Ten.
Everyone, if you grab a seat, we're going to get back to get get the meeting back in. Okay, we are at. We're at item 4B. Uh, Richard, you're on. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. What you have before you this evening is the ZTA that was initiated by the council to extend the deadlines for uh, fire, fire damage structures that were non-conforming structures during the Woolsey fire. So the, after Woolsey, the city enacted a, th a code amendment through ordinance 445, which allowed for the ability for folks to uh, process a planning verification and that would allow for the rebuild of the structure plus 10%. It also, as part of the streamline process, addressed nonconformities. Nonconformities range from a number of items, setbacks, square footage, height, impermeable surface area, uh, so it's a variety of things. And the idea here was to eliminate the need for someone if, who was putting back the same structure in the same footprint uh, they were, let's leave off the 10% for now, but the idea was to, if you were putting back the house that burned, this was your, the, the city streamlined way to put that house back regardless if it required a variance, um, a, some sort of reduction of a side yard setback, or any sort of review related to the height and neighboring views. Now the 10% addition, that had to comply with whatever the, the current codes are. So if you want, uh, say you had a two-story house um, and you had a second floor on the left-hand side of the house and now you want to add a second floor on the right-hand side of the house, that's, that part on the left-hand side of the house got to be put back, no questions asked. If you wanted to, say, put something on that right side of the house, you would need to go through the current process. So. I just want to be clear that what you had was grand, uh, was was had the ability to be rebuilt uh, without any sort of discretionary approvals. As part of that ordinance, a timeline was established, and that's what I'm showing here on this chart. So essentially, it started life with giving folks two years to obtain a planning verification, and then a total of four years to obtain building permits and then extensions could be granted per that ordinance to not total more than five years combined. However, as stated in the report, in 2020, property owners expressed concern to the council about the rebuilding obstacles that have been faced uh, and how the timeline to initiate uh, rebuilding has, has taken time because we've had COVID. Um, there was uh, concerns over construction materials, issues with finding enough qualified engineers. And so as a result of that, uh, the city amended ordinance 445 to add an additional year to all of the deadlines. And so that's why we have the yellow marks on the overlaid on the chart. So as you can see, folks had up until 2021 to a to uh, get their application into the planning department for a planning verification and the deadline to obtain building permits was 2023. And then of course, um, the extensions may not uh, go beyond five years, but we added a year, so it moved it from a 10 year build out to 11 years. Staff was directed to proceed with an ordinance to extend the deadlines, and we did this to be consistent with AB 1500. So that would be to add an extra three years. Also at that same time, the council adopted a resolution to extend the Woolsey fee waiver program another three years. And the planning commission also, when they looked at this, adopted a resolution recommending that the city council uh, approve the th three-year extension of each deadline. So currently, just to give you a quick snapshot in time of where we are, we had 465 homes destroyed, and to date, 369 projects have been submitted. 
the building f official, Ms. Bundy, has, uh, as uh, in previous presentations, uh, explained some of the outreach programs that the ESD department has undertaken to try to get you know 90, the other 96 homes submitted. Uh, however, to date, we we still are awaiting those submittals. So what I'd like to show you here is just what would happen if if the council tonight um, follows staff's recommendation and they participate in the first reading of the ordinance. If we were to remove all the deadlines out three years, what that would mean is that now we're giving folks the opportunity to, for one year, <laughs> submit a application to the planning department for a planning verification because that deadline was November 8th, 2021. It would now be bumped by three years to November 8th, 2024. So there'd be a, a one year opportunity for uh, any of these folks that have not submitted to get an application in. And then also it would then move out the building permit opportunity to November 8th, 2026. And then of course, now there'd be another three years added on to that this window from when the fire started uh, for the extension process. Extensions wouldn't change, but we're, we're moving out the period of time from which you need an extension. That concludes my report on the proposed code amendments and I would be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions from up here? Doug? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, we've got, a, as I read your uh, report, it looks like you've got a 12 year maximum time period before you have to finish the house if we carry on with this. Uh, the what we're saying is 12 years from the fire so yeah. we've moved out our i, I want to say the goal was to keep it short and get folks to rebuild but it would end up being 12 years in terms of finishing the home um, i wish the building official were here to say this but i believe what her answer would be that as long as you've got permits and you're making some progress on those permits there are some extensions that could be given by the building official um, but essentially it's, it's about making progress and the permits would keep renewing themselves. The extension process by the planning commission that's in the ordinance is really designed for the person who has not pulled a permit or their permits have lapsed uh, or they haven't submitted an application uh, to the planning department for uh, a planning approval. So if we made it 10 years, is that practical? The only reason why I'm saying this is it just seems like it's an eternity. It's almost like we're we're granting a, uh, an option to build a house for 12 years as opposed to a right to build a house. Uh, when, when is a logical time to bring this to an end? Is, sure. is there a recommended date or is, or is 12 years a recommended date? So what could, could happen is that we would want to modify the language on basically how many extensions they could get. Because the idea would be to, rather than this, if my left hand represents the fire, we've moved the window out with my right hand. Mm -hmm. What I think you want to do is take the right hand and, and move it back in. So we would want to, for example, uh, we'd want to look at shortening the number of years that the extensions may not, uh, that the, extent, the amount of years of extensions they could get. So in other words, perhaps the extensions may not total more than, you know, we could go back to the six years or seven years or eight years and not necessarily put nine years in there. Okay. Do you have a recommended rec recommended date, number, number of years? What we could look at, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do the math quickly in my head here, is we could look at going back to something that's a bit more consistent. So for example, the planning commission, when they give you a, uh, we, we do five years there. We do the first extension is one is a two year extension. And then we do one year uh, extensions after that. We could simply just say that the planning commission could grant, if it's the council's wish, a two year extension. And, and that's our give to the victim, uh, to the, the person rebuilding the home. 
I hesitate to see, say victim because it, it could be the kids, uh, could be their parents' house or something like that that, that was lost. Yeah, my, my only reason for probably bringing this up is you've got 96 people that you haven't heard from at all, and um, nothing's been submitted. And you keep giving extensions, it would apply to them, so they're basically getting an option to build this over and over for more and more years. I'm just trying to see if there's a finite limit, that's all. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Questions? No? Public comment? Do you have any public comment? No, there are no raised hands. No. And we did not receive any speaker any slips speakers? for this item. Bruce? I have a question. Um, if a non conforming, if, if, I'm sorry, if a house would have exceeded a view, of the neighbor that hadn't been documented but gets documented now, would that house be a non-conforming structure that could be rebuilt despite the view protection? Yes, that's correct. Because we would not, we would not require a a site plan review to be processed. It would now the new parts of the house. If right. that that would be a different. Thing altogether. So, so, so to Norm's point during public comment earlier, if, if someone lost their home and it exceeded 18 feet and it was in a not yet documented view, but which gets documented, they'd still be allowed to rebuild that house in excess of 18 feet, right? Provided it's in the same footprint. Right. Exactly. Yes. But they wouldn't be allowed to build a different house that would that would interfere with a different view that that it didn't previously interfere with. Correct. So if you took the house and say moved it somewhere else in the lot, uh, perhaps changed the configuration so it wasn't kind of a reverse situation going down a slope and now it's mm -hmm. up onto the property, a uh, flat part of the property, that is correct. So even though maybe you could have a situation where the house is as tall as it was, but if it got moved, all bets are off. Okay. So, so in effect, if we extend this, we're also <coughs> somewhat protecting the ability to, to rebuild despite a new view protection, correct? That is correct. Okay, cool. Um, I'd say I, I don't see any difference between this or in any of the other deadlines that we've approved, and so I, I don't see any reason why this would be incongruent with that. And I think that whatever the deadlines are, we've approved extensions for the others. We ought to be doing it for this, which is like what I understand to be the proposal. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so I'll move that we approve the staff's recommendation for this one. Second. If I can uh, read the title of the ordinance, that would be Ordinance Number 513, an ordinance of the City of Malibu approving zoning text amendment number 23-003 to amend Malibu Municipal Code Section 17.60.020C to add three years to the deadline to initiate the planning application process and obtain building permits to rebuild a non-conforming structure that was damaged or destroyed in the Woolsey Fire and finding the action exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Kelsey, roll call, please. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, moving along. Item 6B. The reorganiz no, 6B? 6A. Mayor, are you 6A. looking for item 6A? 6A. I, 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 <clears throat> fingers are moving faster than the mind. All right. Well, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, very excited, actually, this evening to give you our uh, first update on where we're at with our strategic work plan. Uh, as you will recall, we had a series of workshops over the summer as we set to tackle our, our very, very lengthy and very detailed work plan and tried to, or I think hopefully did, come up with a, with a process now to have focused goals that we will be, uh, you know, revisiting every six months and checking in. Uh, this is our, our first check-in since we adopted the goals on September 27th. Again, it's a new process that we're undertaking this year to keep us focused. Um, and it, just to remind everybody, we adopted 20 SMART goals. Those are specific, measurable, achievable, results-oriented, and time-bound goals. Um, and so, as we noted earlier this evening, those goals that didn't make the uh, the cut for this uh, six months will remain in the parking lot, and then we'll hold on to those and bring those back to city council. And then, of course, as also part of this, we did establish a way by if something urgent came up during the six-month period, there was a way for the 
council to uh, to make changes to the list. So, without any further ado, if we can, oh, thank you. You're already on the next slide. So, uh, what you're looking at here, just the picture, is a photograph of the when our employees got together. Uh, I think it was back in early August, and we did a beach cleanup uh, right outside the pier there. So, a little little uh, nice little activity that we had there for the employees. If you go to the next slide. I'm not going to be highlighting all the goals this evening. I'm happy to uh, to take any questions. We are making good progress on all 20 of the goals, but I did want to take an opportunity to highlight five of them here today. And of course, one of them, as, as we all know, is our top goal is to, is to address uh, workplace culture, recruitment, and retention. As we know, if we don't have the, the, the persons and we don't have the talent, then we're not going to be able to achieve our goals. Um, the photo that you're looking here is a uh, an ice cream social that we put on over the summer. We had the management staff dressed up in the aprons and serving the, uh, the cookie and treats to the employees, and I think everybody had a good time. Um, so again, we're making good progress on that. Um, a couple of milestones on that. Uh, we did adopt the winter closure, which we're looking forward to at the end of this month. Uh, as the Mayor Pro Tem uh, noted, we did, we've had two meetings now. Uh, with the Mayor Pro Tem and Councilmember Silverstein to talk about uh, our code of conduct. And we're also going to be bringing back some of the other items that we talked about, about culture enhancement. So we'll be discussing that with the ad hoc going further. And then, of course, later tonight, we also have the discussion for the agenda reordering. So those are all part of the whole. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Retention and recruitment is the number one issue that we got to solve. Otherwise, we can't get all the rest of the stuff done. When do you think you'll have a final recommendation of what we're going to do for recruitment moving forward. Um, well, we can we can get into a little about here tonight in terms of what we've the, what we're working on in terms of that. Um, one thing that we did do, and I know I'm not quite exactly answering your question, so I apologize. Um, we did bring on a. Um, a, a uh, HR firm that is uh, helping us not only with our recruitments, but uh, also giving us some some advice and some expertise on on how we're handling our recruitments and giving us some feedback on how we can improve and enhance that. Uh, the other big part for that um, is is going to be to um, hire our, our human resources director. Uh, we are still in the process of trying to get that filled. Um, and getting that filled will obviously be key to uh, having the HR department fully functioning and being able to, to to reach this goal. So that's really, I think, a very key point is getting that HR director on. Um, so I know I didn't exactly answer your question, but uh, that that is really our, our plan is to is to get the HR director on and continue working with this firm, uh, and then from there we will look at some other some other recommendations that we could bring forward. Move on to the uh, next slide there. Um, strategic plan, uh, highlight number two, public safety. Uh, of course, the last couple of months, we've been very focused um, with addressing safety on PCH. I know that both the public works director and his staff and the public safety director and her staff have been very busy uh, trying to address that over the last 60 days or so. Uh, but as you can see, there's also a number of other milestones here that we've uh, been addressing through our public safety, whether it be the hazard tree removal program, our home ignition zone assessments. Uh, we are um, moving forward with the um, ALPR cameras. Those will be the license plate reader cameras where we, we do have a couple of those approved and we're working on getting uh, the final contracts approved so that we can post those up on the utility poles. Uh, we're working through an update to our emergency plan update. And I know we're doing, continuing to do a lot of things at the staff level to make sure that our staff is prepared for the next emergency. Uh, last week, we just did another drill for our emergency operations center. Uh, and you can see some of the other highlights there as well for public safety. Go on to the next slide, please. Uh, last uh, week, the um, Planning Commission did approve the um, final EIR and the um, plan for the uh, skate park. Um, fortunately, took a, a little bit of the shine off the luster of this goal with the uh, appeal that was filed today, but that's okay. That is that is part of the process that we follow as part of local government. Um, but we were we are happy to announce that we, um, you know, got that through planning commission and um, 
depending on the outcome of the appeal, uh, we will be coming back to City Council at a, at a later date uh, to nail down the final details for the park, and including the budget and whatnot. Is that appealable to the Coastal Commission? Richard? Uh, went out to the lobby. I, I don't believe it is. Okay. Uh, Trevor, thank you. Chairman, I think that part of, I guess, you, I'm sorry, part of Bluff Park is, but I think this is beyond the appeal jurisdiction, but to check. Okay. Good stuff. Nice. We'll double check that. Good question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, moving on to next slide, please. So this is a photograph showing the groundbreaking at the uh, Malibu High School, which was just a couple of months ago. Uh, that was one of our goals, is to move forward with the uh, coastal development permit for Malibu High School. So we're happy to note that that one has been complete. And again, this photo from the groundbreaking ceremony on October 30th. Go to the next slide, please. This, uh, this highlights um, what we've, the progress that we've been making with our development services and, and the, big, uh, the big achievement that we have there is that we're, we're moving forward with the implementation of the Bloom Beam software. Uh, this is really a, a big a critical first step for us to be able to start managing our data and being able to track uh, a lot better what we're doing in terms of development services. Uh, this is gonna help the three departments coordinate uh, their activities much better. Um, this, we're estimating about 12 weeks for the next phase of Blue Beam development, uh, when we should uh, to have that complete by February 2024. Uh, I think we're all in City Hall pretty excited about Blue Beam, and we'll keep you apprised as we move forward with that. And then next steps, we will be uh, coming back at March 20th for a special city council meeting. At that point, we would be doing the reevaluation and reprioritization of the strategic work plan. Uh, we'll take a look at all those items that are on the parking lot. Uh, we'll get general feedback from the council in terms of how we're been moving forward on the goals. Uh, we'll see what can come off or what has been completed. Uh, and at that point, we could also consider any new goals uh, beyond those that are sitting in the parking lot right now. Um, so that's just a, a quick overview of, of where we're at right now. Uh, as I noted, I was not going to go through all 20 goals, uh, but they are detailed for you in the staff report. Uh, and myself and the department heads are here to answer any questions that you may have. Questions? Doug? Well, just a kind of a quick question and just see how we're handling it. One of the items you have on the list there are the uh, automatic license plate readers. Those have been hanging with Edison for months. What's our process for, or how are you addressing things that get stuck or not getting completed? And that's one of them, so I'm just using that as an example. But, you know, the ones that work well, that's great, but what about the ones that are stuck? Yeah, I, I think for me as a manager, it's, there's two things there. Um, one, you gotta make sure that you have a process so that you're catching things when they get stuck. I think that's that's critically important from a management standpoint. You gotta know where something is, and know that it's gotten gotten lost, gotten stuck. Uh, quite frankly, I think the answer really depends on, on what the issue is. Uh, if it's something internal, that's a, a little bit more easier for us to address. A little more challenging when we're having to deal with an outside agency uh, like, uh, like Edison or, or the state of California. Um, we do have liaisons and we, 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 we do make contact with them and if we uh, need some assistance, we will contact them to see if they can, can help us out. Question, if, by the way, if, if those are still not on the Go Edison ahead. polls on January 8th when that uh, representative comes here, I think I know what I'm, my first question is gonna be. And, and uh, unfortunately, our public safety director was not able to be here tonight, but I, I will check in with her and, and see what the latest uh, report is on those. Got one public comment speaker, Joe Drummond, you want to come on up. Hi again. Uh, so we love the planning department and I'm glad you're working on increasing morale and mutual respect and that's wonderful. I'm, I'm happy it's working. So going through the strategic plan, I noted the following. Small projects need priority. I, of course, am still waiting for my 64 square foot deck to be approved. Every step in extra review seems to take weeks, sometimes months. For instance, it took six months for a geo to realize that they had all the requirements submitted and never looked at it. So I'm hoping everything is submitted now as I've been waiting for a response about the plans I submitted via engineering and geo reports. I was hoping to be approved before the break, so still crossing my fingers. And then I'm sure this also affects fire rebuilds as well. 
Um, the skate park needs to be approved. I'm assuming the strange and maybe not so strange ungifter of the land suddenly is the one wrongly appealing the project and I hope it can come to council quickly for you all to approve for the sake of our kids and our community. I do hope that most ADUs are, that are detached, et cetera, require CDP and not just an APR when staff goes through this again. And you can work with the Public Safety Department to justify two egresses requirements as this was not removed for all ADUs in very high fire hazardous severity zones in Portola Valley, just a portion of them as I understand it from the HCD review. And also we appreciate all the work with the Coastal Vulnerability Assessment and I look forward to seeing the results of the technical study that show projected sea level rise scenarios along Malibu's coast. I was doing the, the ghost tires thing and the, all the public safety stuff for PCH that day so I couldn't go to that meeting but I'm hoping, it, it can, I, I hope it's available on the website somewhere. Um, also, GEO needs to understand at the beginning of a project, such as my small deck, that no variance is required for CDP exempted projects to limit the studies and hours required and the expense to applicants of small projects. I understand that a fee study also has been financed by Matrix Consulting, although it would have been free to have an ad hoc committee of affected residents work on this. Mary Uring had asked me to send my suggestions to the fee schedule to Joe, Tony, and Renee, which I did, and I hope that they will be shared with the consultant from several residents' point of view and not the developers. Glad we are also helping the labor exchange. They are amazing when you're in a pinch and need, to help, need help right away. And the Civic Center Wastewater, just wondering if the studies really warrant a sewer plan in the area. And I'm hopeful that the PCH signal synchronization with its red light detecting speeding, et cetera, along with emergency action taken by the city council in January, such as emergency meetings, et cetera, will make PCH safer. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Any hands on the, oh, sure. Ryan. There are two raised hands. First, we'll hear from Ryan. I don't know why I even ask you guys. I could do it all from up here. Ryan, go ahead. Yes, I'm here. The, um, I have a couple things. The first would be to address the uh, Civic Center sewer and to do the application for a 100% fee waiver for all of the assessment district fees for the existing low income housing in Malibu that is part of the low housing goal. Uh, the low income goal is to retain all current housing at that price point. And for which the Malibu Canyon Village condominium complex is almost exclusively the low income housing. If this were to pass as an assessment district under phase two, the extra $10,000 a year per condo, just to have uh, what we currently have now working in our existing sewage treatment plant is an economic burden that makes no sense. Uh, there's couple ways to accomplish that and that is um, through the grants program or direct grant from the city to accomplish the clean water goal. The existing sewage treatment plant that serves all of the condos in the Civic Center area, including townhomes uh, on DeVille Way and Vista Pacifica Street, have never been demonstrated to have contributed or caused any pollution in Malibu Lagoon or the Civic Center Basin. And the Civic Center Basin is classified for potential emergency drinking water and should not be. It is a salty marsh and that correction needs to occur so that the water board can properly process these requests. That request should come as a filing from the city to the state water board. That would be a correction for the classification of the water basin for what it is. Um, the last one it has to do with the proposal for a city ordinance on inspecting the elevated elements of, of multifamily housing, which is the balcony projection. And that needs to be taken in context that Malibu has balconies that, that stick out over rocks in the ocean, one of which fell off a few years ago. And then the other balconies that are simply a balcony over another balcony or over the ground, which may be, you know, eight to 10 feet off the ground, a level, a sturdy surface. So for balcony surfaces that are more than 10 feet above another structural floor or level ground, it makes a lot of sense to prioritize. 
an elevated element that is not of a height or over a dangerous condition should be categorized differently under a different category, schedule, or implementation priority. Thanks, Ryan. There's a lot about. Next stand. Pamela Colony Ulick. Pamela, you're on. Hi, thanks again. I wanted to talk about staff recruitment and retention. I think number one is affordable housing. And you as a city council hopefully can be creative with the commercial slash mixed use with the properties you have. I think this is something that you really need to take a hard look at for not just the staff, but for also first responders, lifeguards, police, sheriffs, teachers, et cetera. And you really have to look at that because without that, you're not gonna get more uh, the staff. It's just too hard, the commute. Number two, daycare. When I was on city council, we were considering putting a daycare facility up at Bluffs Park. And I really feel like this would help you recruit and um, enhance the lives of staff members who are trying to raise families, have children and raise them. And I would urge you to be creative again, to try and get some type of facility, whether it's in with the land that we have that hasn't been used, et cetera, or Bluffs Park, you have to be creative and you have to offer these types of benefits to, to attract the best people in the world to come to Malibu because that is needed. Um, but, and thanks for the, the city manager. I appreciate uh, the parties that you're you know, having for the staff. I would, I would encourage you to also invite the community to those ice cream parties or the other things that you're having, just so the community can also get to know your staff. Um, and I think it's important that we all um, appreciate how much the hard work you're doing. Here you are, it's 1042, I'm gonna stop now. Um, but you work hard and late, and I'm glad to see you're gonna hopefully move these um, meetings up earlier in time too. So hopefully that'll help. Thanks again, bye-bye. Thank you, Pamela. No more hands, no more hands. No, no more hands. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to note for the one public speaker that the we do have a recording of the Coastal Vulnerability Assessment Virtual Workshop. It's on the uh, city website. Okay. Comments, questions? Mary Ann? I just wanted to verify. I know um, the last time we looked at this, um, I had asked a question about the permanent snack shack at Bluffs Park and wanted to make sure that's still in the process of getting completed. Um, since it's not on this, just want to make sure it's still moving forward and there haven't been any delays with that. Yes, it's still moving forward. I'm not aware of any delays. Perfect. Thank you. Anybody else? Paul? Bruce? I just have one, one comment. I want to go back to the recruitment and retention piece. Uh, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I, what you, the piece that you're trying to, but at some point in time, that, this is the most important thing we got to do. So at some point, and I don't know if you guys are planning in addition to getting an HR person and re intellect, are there other steps that you're looking at? Who, who is driving that process? It is, is going to say, when I get done, you know, here are the five or six things that I want to do differently than I'm doing today. They're going to give me some chance to bring people in. Where, where, where does that come from? First off, I want to thank you, Mr. Mayor, for giving me another shot at the question. Um, and one of the things that I neglected to mention is that, you know, right now we are going through a, a classification and compensation study. Um, and that is not only looking at the job descriptions, but also at the salaries for the employees. So that is one of the tools that we have right now that we're looking, uh, looking at and, and using as part of this evaluation. Um, so I know that was one thing that I, that I neglected to mention from my earlier answer. Um, and Joe, Mr. Tony, is there anything else that um, sure uh, that Thank you, you can city add manager. to the Thank conversation? You. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, City Manager McClary and uh, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, honestly, everything on the list is all part of the recruitment and retention at the end of the day. Um, improving the culture, uh, looking for an HR manager, trying to streamline our processes, looking at class and comp. Um, all of the above will help improve what we're trying to do and help improve our image as an organization to attract uh, talent 
Um, so it, it's all encompassing. And then the, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Target date for getting that. Recruitment is our biggest problem, right? If we can't get something going where we're bringing people in and holding on to them, we're never going to get past the 20 items we got. And if we get through, so when when do you see that thing sort of being? I, I can stand up and say, okay, we've got all the pieces in place now. We're going to start seeing people stay, and we're going to start seeing ourselves getting better recruit. When do you see that happening? Well, I think the act, the tangible dates would be our class and comp study. That should be finished by the end of the year. We should be coming back to council probably in February with an update on that report and then embedding that into the budget. Um, we're trying to do a new recruiting software. That should probably be in place in a number of months. Um, but the culture aspect of that, that's, that's an ongoing effort. That's never ending. Um, and that's something that we're actively trying to improve. And so there's not a hard deadline on that. But... With the policy ad hoc um, and bringing some of these items forward to you, that'll be an ongoing effort. But that's a lifetime endeavor. Um, you know, it takes a long time to build up a positive culture and make it attractive, and it can be torn down in a minute. So um, that'll be never ending. Cool. Okay. Anybody else? Do we need to make a motion, or we just receive and file on this? Is receive and file? I think. Yeah, receiving file, so we're all set in that one. All right, guys, it is 1046. And I believe we're supposed to end at 1030. So I'll make a motion that we hear item 6C next. Need four votes. 6C or 6C? 6C, the road race. Okay. Since I think we have several people here waiting to hear that item, so. I'll second the motion. We have a first and a second. Are you ready to call the question? Four votes, go ahead. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? No. Mayor Yearing? How many people are here for the road race? We have approximately 18 speaker slips, and we may have a few speakers on Zoom as well. Okay. That will bring us well past. 1130. Uh, look, you got I, I have no, I mean, I enjoy this job and I, I stay late as often as I can. But guys, we're not, I'm, I don't want to be here at 1130 at night. So if you guys can figure out how to get one or two speakers up, tell us what you want. And we can take, I'll stick around and take, if we can't do that, we'll have to do it another night. So. Whoever's, whoever's running the road race program. I don't think that's feasible. I just don't think they're going to do it. I'm saying let's come back. Yeah, let, you, if, look, if we're going to do if you and I look, I know there are I've received a ton of emails. All right. Uh, both from Michael Epstein, who was, you know, he, what he's trying to do. There's the super group that's trying to do something. There's another um, Malibu Moves, which is another group, I guess, that submitted a, a proposal. And then there's the one that did the triathlon or the 5K. So I, I'm going to vote no. Yeah. Motion fails. Before, before we adjourn, can we get a consensus to bring this back as the first item after the preliminaries at the next meeting so that we don't risk this happening again? Okay. It's the same way we just did. Well, yeah, so what we're proposing is we're, next meeting, this will be before we do the public comment, just like we did with the ADUs tonight. So we'll get it up there early. You guys can speak, uh, and we can at least listen to what you have to say and give you an, a rational hearing so that we're, we're not cutting people off. Can we get a consensus Mr. Mayor, on that? Mr. Mayor. Make a comment before? Yeah, please. Um, so the only thing I'm concerned I'd like to hear from the road rates um, applicants, um, I think they have time constraints to be able to plan this. So I think they're really searching to get this finalized as quickly as possible. 
Is there any way we can do a special meeting or? They, we're, they we're, just need to get everything in process. It takes months to get this going to be able to plan these races. And even though they're in October or November, they need to start making contracts well, with it's re, it's providers. Re, it's really down as far as I can tell the two, two groups, right? The Michael Epstein group and the Super League. I no, think no there's, four, there's four competing for two slots. Right. Yeah, but I think what the recommendation came back with the, the, the two that they wanted. And I think, well, okay, I'm not going to make decisions up here now. All right, so I'm is, just, is there a time constraint? Yes. What is, that, what is the time constraint? Everybody would like to get it done quicker, but I mean, it's, if, we, one if, we keep, if we keep you down, for, if we put it on the next meeting, can you live with that? January 8th. Come to the microphone, please. Okay, we're not going to do this item, so if, you, if somebody's got something to say. 30 quick, seconds quick. to say what the time constraints are. Anyone? No? If not, okay. we're going to move it. All right, January 8th, you got a deal. Okay. Great. All right, and we'll bring it up. It'll be, this, it'll be right after the, the presentations on January 8th. Motion to adjourn. Second. Mayor, just so I can have that clarification, there is consensus from the council to yes. schedule this item before public comment for items not on the agenda on your January Anybody 8th agenda. Anybody disagree with that? No, no, we already voted. Done. All right, guys. And we're going to move item need, 6B. That, that was all I needed. I just wanted to make sure that was clear consensus for scheduling okay. that agenda. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Do we need to deal with 6B as far as getting it scheduled? We'll just come back next time. Come back next time. It would okay. come back at the January right. meeting. Second. Second. Roll call, Kelsey. And Mayor, who were you adjourning in memory of? Uh, yes. Carl Vellante. E O L A N T E. Okay. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Motion carries. You are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.